books, but through teaching and learning. Then I felt that the passion of being a teacher was calling me. I went to the University of Johannesburg. By then, I, were, I had a PhD. I became a senior lecturer at the University of Johannesburg for six years. I was promoted to associate professorship in 2012 at the University of Johannesburg. Then I moved horizontally to the University of South Africa in 2012, December. I, I joined the Department of Inclusive Education, but in training, I'm in psychology of education. In 2015, I was promoted to full professor in the field of psychology of education. My niche area of research is wellness. Hence, anything that I touch in research is on wellness. If I research with you on ODEL, I'll be looking at wellness. If I research with you on uh, student support, I'll be looking at wellness. If I research with you on CPD, I'll be looking at wellness. That's who I am. So I wanted to give you this background so that you understand that you are talking to a teacher in the blood, a teacher who has been at different levels. Now, in this context, I've been seconded to this position uh, from the 1st of July as the acting executive director in the Department of Tuition, Support, and Facilitation of Learning. So what I do best is to teach and to facilitate. So this is who I am. I just want to say a warm good morning to all in your own languages. Can you all respond in your own language? Thank you very much. So I put all the languages, including the sign language, so that you become comfortable and we greet according to the who we are. Thank you very much. In my introductory remarks, I want to uh, apologize on behalf of Prof. Mozart. She'll be joining us shortly. She's in one critical meeting, but she will be here in a short while. I was fascinated by the theme of the Teaching and Learning Festival last week. Kubumba, Hubopa, forming, Hubopa, molding, Kubumba, Ubumba. So all those words, they talk to us as people who are in the context of facilitation, uh, tuition, and support for our students. If you can see on the extreme left for, my, for me here, there's a, a stone was thrown into the dam, and then ripples were formed. This is in line with the ecosystemic theory of Yuri Bronfenbrenner. In life, there are things that start at a particular place and then ripples are formed. And when ripples are formed, it means there's a sphere of influence. Hence, as human beings, in whatever environment where we occur, there are ecosystemic factors be it from the microsystem, from the exosystem, from the chronosystem, the time in which we occur, and the values that we find ourselves that are determined by the macrosystem, that determine the who we are, how we work, how we react. So in that way, there is also another analogy that I looked at to say, in our way of molding our students, in our way of trying to teach them uh, from the andragogical perspective, we also need to pause a little bit and reflect. I looked at the image then of a cat, a cat which is seeing a lion, <laughs> or a lion which is seeing a cat. And I looked at myself, I said, as I'm molding my students, Prof Mahanu, are you a cat or are you a lion? What are your students seeing? Because I'm still having a module in the College of Education. Then secondly, I looked at the picture there of 
a lady who is saying, inside every person, you know there is a person you don't know. The reflective in the mirror. So no, the reflection in the mirror. And then I like the last picture of a young toddler. Be the best version of you. And I'm new in this territory, but I reflected in my first two weeks and together with Professor Mutsa, we said, we need to find, the hum to humanize the work environment, building the Ubuntu, the Boto, the humane relationship. That's what we reflected upon because both of us were new. She came in May, I came in July, and then we said, let's, let's, let me be a person who is showing Boto, a person who is showing the humane characteristics towards the colleagues that I'll be working with. This is the biggest unit in the whole university. And as we move along, because you don't know me, but am I a cat or a lion? <laughs> that's that's who, who, who are you asking yourself? Is this new director a cat or a lion? And then that's, that's the way we are going. But our main mandate is to look at the strategic focus areas. The university is giving us the four uh, strategic focus areas. But somewhere, if at all I'm a lion, I will not be able to ensure that we achieve and attain the strategic focus areas. So what needs to happen is that as we move along, I must be the best that I'm supposed to be. You must be the best that you are supposed to be in this context. Because the main thing is to mold our students. If I'm building the study material, the final, final output is the student who's having the graduate attributes. The first fo strategic focus area, accelerating the shift towards becoming a leading African Odell comprehensive university in teaching and learning, research, innovation, and community engagement based on scholarship. Now, the issue of scholarship in all the units, in all uh, um, directorates, how are we pushing it? Is there any productivity on research? The DCDT research, CPDD's research, DLS research, CTU research, acquire research. This is who we are supposed to be, ladies and gentlemen, the scholarship. If there's no scholarship, it means we are not reflecting on our practice. I cannot write the study material or guide the college that I'm leading as a DCDT personnel, but not having a moment of reflection on my practice. It means somewhere I'm lacking. So um, during this period while we are um, 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 caretaking, we are going to research on our practice, be it in language, be it in, in, in study material development, be it in uh, um, a professional development. Let us build an element of praxis. Let's reflect on our praxis and write. Let there be publications out there from a Cordell institution. Number two, strategic focus area number two, to be agile and embed innovative, collaborative, efficient, and sustainable institution. Innovation should come from us because we are working with key things that are leading the institution. Number three, to build an organizational ICT for IR and fifth IR technology capacity to enable the transformation. This is us who must inform ICT. We must lead ICT 
in the new technologies that they must be developing in every unit. If there's no research, we won't be able to inform ICT. ICT must not be the head, but pedagogy, hutagogy, and ragogy as we develop the study material then they must know what to do, being informed by us the, the other way round. It should be the other way round. The last one, to accelerate the transformation of governance, student workforce composition, the research agenda, and the curriculum. This is who we are. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say today we are fortunate that in the working environment, where we occur in having all the strategic focus areas being achieved. The element of humaneness should be key. I may be how intelligent, but if I don't have the humane element, I will fail. I will fail in leading, I will fail in achieving the goals. Working in a peaceful environment makes you to be more productive. But working in a toxic environment, it kills your spirit and you become less productive. The purpose of today's workshop is to make sure that our environment become an enabling environment, a humane element, I mean environment, which will enhance productivity. Today's workshop is not about blaming. It's about looking in the mirror and saying, I'm a cat, but I see a lion. And then if I'm a lion, I must say, hey, but I need to be humane and, and work in a harmonious environment together with my colleagues. Then productivity will be enhanced. We are having the specialists today. I'm not the person to introduce them. I've requested my colleagues to introduce them. We have our psychologist here, a registered psychologist, and we also have our doctor, Jerimo Fukengwa Maketa, who's a legend in film industry and also an educated man in communities. Ladies and gentlemen, our program today, as it will be running, we request that we are here and just to imbibe and to make sure that whatever that was planned for the day, we achieve it. And all of us should benefit from it. The lessons that we'll be taking will not only benefit the work environment, but it will benefit the holistic being of us, even where we come from. As I showed those concentric circles of a microsystem, the exosystem, and also the macrosystem. What we are going to gain is going to benefit us. I listened to the psychologist, I listened to Dr. Mufuking, in most of the uh, episodes on television and also on face to face. And I saw many people, even myself, benefiting from their tutelage. I'm going to call upon Dr. Pumza Makhatu to come and introduce our first keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker will be addressing that topic that is on the program and uh, we are going to keep time so that we have a moment of question and answer and we are all going to benefit. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Prof. Uh, good morning, colleagues. It's good to see you again physically. I'm really happy to be here. Without any waste of time, I'm going to introduce Me Nkateko. Prof, you took down the, the program. <laughs> uh, Me Nkateko 
Ndala Mahor. Menkateko is a registered counseling psychologist with the Health Professional Council of South Africa. She is a managing director of a well-established, fast-growing and vibrant practice, Pretoria Psychologist, PTY LTD, in Sunnyside, Pretoria. In collaboration with the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, SADC, Pretoria Psychologists conduct free monthly support groups first Wednesday of every month, as well as offer hashtag Monday Ritzeni with Pretoria Psychologists series through YouTube and Facebook to have a greater reach to the community with psychological advice and service. Her over 20 years experience in facilitating, coaching and lecturing in various platforms, both locally and internationally, adds to the excellent, skillful and insightful presenter on topics of well-being, mental health, leadership, self-mastery and personal development. She is an experienced researcher who has co-published academic journals and chapters in books in international publications. Lastly, owing to her love for teaching, she enjoys media presence in informing the public on issues of mental health in layman's terms. She has been featured a number of times on various SABC and DSTV talk shows and current affairs on mental health matters, as well as give regular expert opinion pieces in various magazines, newspapers, and journals. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a privilege and an honor for me to be standing in front of you this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mahanu, for inviting me and Dr. Jeremy Fugeng also um, for us to be present here with you this morning. And I'm hoping that this is going to be a fruitful morning as we embark on um, emotional intelligence, human relation work in the work in the community and also in society. I believe as a human being, we cannot disintegrate ourselves into fragments. So we cannot say, as I come to work, leave your whatever at home and be at work. We are humans that are a whole or a total. So whatever happens to me at home, it will surely impact on me at work. Whatever impacts on me at work will surely impact me um, at home. So I think today we are just going to be speaking over how do we manage ourselves as, you know, this whole, wholeness um, to be able to be effective in our work environment. I think maybe to even make a, a, a greater case on what Prof. Mahanu has 
um, shared earlier on in talking to wellness. Um, I think this code is really in the way, but we'll see how we can manage it. Maybe by putting it in some it's, chair or something like that, yeah. Maybe wrapping it up, because I can't see you. I have to <laughs> always, you know, go over the cord to be able to see you. And uh, for me, human, human interaction is also connection. Uh, by the way, uh, just a background story. I, um, okay, I think Prof does know. I resigned from the University of Pretoria from being an academic for 11 years in 2020, 2020 key word, COVID, because I had lost the touch and the interaction with students. I mean, yes, we went hybrid. Uh, we were seeing students online, uh, but for me, it was not the same. It did not cut it. And that's also where Monday Ritzen with Pretoria Psychologists was born because I was also missing the classroom so much. And I thought, you know, with this teaching, let me just do a YouTube uh, channel because then it's the same as how we are teaching our, our, our students. Maybe it was an impulsive decision, I don't know, uh, from a very temporary situation, but I had, I must say, I had missed this kind of um, an, an interaction. So I'm, I'm very happy that conferences and seminars are happening in person and that this is not a webinar as well. Um, I, I, I was, I'm just um, inviting now to a webinar next month and I'm thinking ah oh, why didn't they make it a face-to-face -face? because I miss this human interaction element so as I was saying just to make a case of what prof was talking about on well-being I think in organizations there is overwhelming proof uh, to the link of well-being and productivity um, that one we you know we can go to many um, uh, research and journals to just look at how a person, when they are well, they perform better, and how when they are not well, they actually perform poorly. I have what I call a, and, and, and if one of you are managers to somebody who is my client, you might want to question the sick note, but this is my theory. If somebody comes to me and says, you know, consult with me and ask me for a sick note, I liberally, give a sick note. I will tell you why. Because for that person to be asking for a sick note, it means that there's something that is happening in their workspaces that is not allowing them to just say, can I please take my child to the dentist? Number one. Number two, I would rather have a person legitimately sit at home, be sick, than to come and be moody and broody and pass the so-called time and taxpayers' money, paying a chess game or a solitaire, if there, those solitaires still available, um, you know. So I will say to them, some of them, I will even liberally give them sick leave and say, you know what, I think with what, you, what is happening, you need to be home. And they will be like, ah, oh, but I need to be at work. I say, okay, you told me. Yesterday, you were looking at the laptop for the whole day. So you are going to do what at work? Just to show face, so that you have points. By the time I left uh, University of Pretoria, by the way, I did not, I had zero absenteeism, as in zero, 11 years, zero. I remember this other time, I went to the doctor, I had tonsillitis. I uh, went to the doctor and then the doctor wanted to book me off for a week. I said, no, no, I've got a class tomorrow. I'm teaching. That's because of the environment and the passion and the productivity that I bring to the space. I did not need the leave. Yes, it's academia, it's, academia, it's flexible. I could, after teaching, uh, go home and I knew that, that I could do that, but it was not necessary. So on the extreme part of the pendulum, I'm saying that where I can be liberal, so that is what I'm saying as managers, from now on, if a sick note is coming from Pretoria psychologists, start to scrutinize it. But I am just talking about, you know, the, 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 the reason, as a result of this, um, many organizations and institutions, because of not looking after the well-being of their um, employees, they lose on so much productive hours. 
But if we invest like we are investing this morning into the wellness of our employees, we know that we are dealing with employees or you as an employee, you come with a bounce in your step. As I said, I said to the doctor, I don't need the sick leave because I was passionate about the class that I was going to deliver and I also knew that I could be able to be at liberty to go and you know, uh, maybe uh, nest my tonsillitis or whatever the case might be. So I'm saying that it is very important to have such um, you know, uh, seminars, workshops, because it goes hand in hand with how productive and how much we can produce in our input. When you hear of the word EQ, what do you hear? EQ, yeah, emotional intelligence, yeah, but what do, you, what do you hear from it? Yes, we've got IQ, I think all of us are sitting here because we have a certain uh, uh, level of IQ, you know, our numbers, they show a certain, but EQ, would you say you are sitting here because of your EQ? No. Okay. Not necessarily. Okay. So EQ, obviously, it is emotional intelligence, and I will just uh, quickly make a case for that. Uh, this is what William Jennings Bryant said. Destiny is not a matter of chance. It is a matter of choice. It is not the thing to be waited for. It is a thing to be achieved. Because sometimes people think, okay, you know, as it happens, or I will get that promotion, or I will, you know, get to publish, or I will get to uh, perform a little bit better. Things are not up to chance. We cannot wait for those chances. We have to be creating those chances, and we'll see how we create those chances in a moment. Um, what will be your mental model of intelligence on the different... Uh, pictures, and I should have had the one, or uh, um, I should have had Dr. Mufakeng's one as well, so that I can hear your opinion. Okay, so um, the different. Um, okay, should I? Okay. Uh, okay, it's going to be hard. So I have to stick with this, all right. I'm somebody who moves a lot around the room, but I think because of the, for the sake of the video, I will have to stick uh, to the podium. Okay, what is your mental model of intelligence? Let's start with the first uh, picture at the right, uh, left, left corner. What will be your mental model of intelligence? What, what do you think when you see that picture? Sacrifice. Sacrifice, okay. And we'll get, we'll get to that, okay. And then the second one? Limitless. Limitless, ambition. Okay, the third one? Okay. Okay. Smart. Um, chaos, radical, shrewd, smart. Different, different, different. Okay. The fourth one, Mark. Innovative. Money. Ruthless. Okay. Uh, bottom corner. Uh, sorry, left. <laughs> yes. No comment. No comment. Uh, it's Steve Hofmeyer. Uh, for those who don't know him. Others. Controversial. Controversial. Okay. The um, next one. Ruthless. Others. Idiot. Okay. Self-centered. Okay. And, and, and by the way, you ask somebody who uh, was under maybe the regime, uh, uh, SS Zimbabwe tent from Rhodesia, they might not say the same words, isn't it? Okay, all right. So do you see, these are mental models. Okay. Um, Oprah Winfrey? Caring. Caring. Okay. Shed? Sharing, caring, generous, okay? Okay, and then we need Madikizela Mandela. Patience, courage, okay? 
And other people might say other things, isn't it? <laughs> the things that I will not mention in this room <laughs> since it's actually commemorated to her. So do you see that these are faces of people? Nobody has suggested anything to you to say, but you immediately, when you see those people's faces, you had an opinion. I, I will ask, maybe some of you have had tea with some of these people, but I will say, did you even have tea with this person for you to be able to make that perception and that conclusion and that judgment about a person? I mean, I'm dressed this way right now. You have a particular perception about me, but should you have met me in the morning after my job, me smelling of sweat, with hair undone, with my sneakers that might have holes, all of that, you will definitely have a different opinion about me. Do you see how we quickly can make a whole story about a situation, about a moment, about a context, about a person? And as I said, did we even have tea with any of these people for us to say this. Maybe if I had a, a, a beautiful lunch with them, I'll say differently about them versus I had a beautiful lunch and they made me pay the bill. I might have a different opinion about them. This is what um, the American Express financial advisor uh, said. It, it was a, a Dave Linick, the executive VP, he said, Emotional competence is a single most important personal quality that each of us must develop and access to experience a breakthrough. Only through managing our emotions can we access our intellect and our technical competence. I want you to underline that. Only through managing our emotions can we access our intellect and also our technical competencies. So we do have our technical competencies, we do have our intellect, but we can only access them to the maximum, to their full potential, through the help of emotional uh, intelligence. So an emotionally competent person performs better under pressure, and we'll see that in a moment. This is what Daniel Goldman, so he's also a father of EEQ, or emotional intelligence. We are being judged by a new yardstick. But, well, it's not so new anymore since uh, the research. Not just how smart we are or by our training and expertise, but also by how well we handle ourselves and also each other. That's how we are measured. We are not measured by this person is a genius. But how does the person treat an individual or individuals? When we look, and this is just a little bit of back background, the origins of emotional intelligence, it comes from the two domains, so the intel intelligence, the intellect, and then the emotion, so there's no singly, clearly demarcated starting point for, for, for that. Um, but if we look at where it was developed, so the, the, we, we can actually call it social intelligence, uh, that Thorndike um, uh, 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 um, developed, so the non-cognitive intelligent uh, by Veshla as well, I think some of you, you are familiar with the test. Intelligence and emotions represent two domains in psychology that are, have enjoyed significant attention as both represent an area regarded as a major division of the mind. So intelligence provides an indication of efficiency of the cognitive sphere while emotions belong to the affective sphere of the mind. So both go hand in hand. So this is just a brief history of how the emotional intelligence was developed. So where we are now, um, you know, I think some of you might have even taken the test, the Byron test on emotional uh, intelligence, the assessment. And um, as I said, um, Goldman popularized the concept of emotional intelligence. So that is just a brief history for your interest. So again, as I continue for the case for emotional intelligence, so it has shown, and this are uh, many studies, so a study 
of UC Berkeley. It, it was a PhD study over 40 years found that emotional intelligence was four times more powerful than IQ, which is the inter, 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 intellectual uh, coefficient in predicting who achieves success in their field even from hard scientists. So when we say hard scientists, which I don't necessarily like separating the two because then it means there are soft sciences and there are hard sciences, but for the sake of understanding and for argument's sake, the hard sciences will be you know, biochemistry, engineering, where the so so soft sciences will be uh, the humanities and the economics. But it shows that even in the hard sciences where people will actually say or term emotions as not necessary for uh, um, uh, the business or being successful in, that, uh, in those fields. So you'll find a person saying, you know, I am not emotional or I'm not an emotional being because I am dealing with the heart sciences. But when you look closer, because of their human interactions and their human relations, they were able as an engineer as a uh, pharmacist or a lab technician, be able to be separated from their peers in moving forward and being successful in that environment. So my best study comparing outstanding managers with average managers found that 90% of the difference was because of the emotional intelligence. Again, not the hard sciences or the skill, but the emotional intelligence. So in a worldwide study of uh, what companies were looking for in hiring new employees, 67% of the most desirable attributes were emotional competencies or the emotional intelligence competencies. So are you able to connect to people? Are you able to have an understanding? How do you deal? Uh, what, what is the most popular uh, question that they ask in interviews? How do you deal with pressure? I think I, I, I don't think I've missed that question in any interview. How do you deal with pressure? That is an emotional intelligent question. Because you could be skilled in whatever you need to be skilled with. You know, say you are in a plant, you are a, uh, what do we call this, engineers, uh, maybe in a tobacco plant, um, and you need to run the, the production line. But then, then something goes wrong that you, you do not even know in terms of your skill, but how you are going to be calming yourself and thinking about that situation is going to separate you between being successful and failing in that operation. So in a study, again, um, of highly emotionally intelligent partners in a, conf uh, in a consulting firm, the high emotional intelligent partners contributed more than twice as much revenue to the company as did the low emotional intelligent partners. Why do you think that was? In a firm where, where the, 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 the partners with high emotional intelligence contributed twice as much revenue to the company, to the firm, more than the ones with low um, EQ. Relationships. relationships, exactly. Building relationships, networks, being able maybe to affirm people, read the space. I mean, there are people who are unable to read the space. You know, when the space says we, we don't really want to engage, we don't really want to talk, and they, they still, they are in your face. Or even, let's say, um, another element or component of emotional intelligence is how you regard yourself, so say the self-regard. And you come, you are highly skilled, but you see yourself as a, whether it's a lion or a cat, whichever way that you see yourself. So exactly that, relationships. So both cognitive and emotional intelligence have a role to play in determining success in life. But as I said, IQ can predict between one to 20% of success within a job and then while emotional intelligence could directly be responsible for between 27 and 45 in the success. So 90% 90, 90 of abilities that distinguish outstanding leaders from, from mediocre leaders relate to emotional intellig intelligent abilities um, where there's results from many studies, as I mentioned, um, as making a case for emotional intelligence. 
So what is it? What is this emotional intelligence all about? When we look at um, that graph over there, so the concept of emotional intelligence incorporates meanings associated with both the emotional component and the intelligent component of the construct. So emotional intelligence therefore involves the ability to perceive accurately, okay, key, perceive accurately, appraise and express emotions, access and generate feelings which facilitate thought, understand emotions and emotional knowledge, and regulate emotions to promote emotional and intellectual growth. So, I mentioned that things that happen in our personal life, uh, we cannot separate ourselves from that in coming to work. We cannot say, leave your home life at work or leave your work life uh, from work when you come to the, the house. So what we mean when we say to be able to regulate emotions. So let's say my cat died this morning. That would be a very, very, very sad day for cat lovers. So my cat died this morning and I have to come and do the presentation. If I am not emotionally intelligent, every second word that I will be telling you about was my cat Kiki. By the way, that's my daughter's cat. It's my cat Kiki. So I'll be like, for example, when Kiki came to the room and when Kiki was eating this and when we went to, and therefore I'm unable to regulate my emotions and even be sensitive enough to say, some people might even have a phobia for cats for that matter. And that is the inability because of whatever I'm going through to emotionally regulate. It's not to say that I should not bring the sad emotions of my cat having died. But it's to say, okay, my cat has died. I acknowledge that. I am very sad. I might have actually a very bad day. If I see that this is going to be in the way and it's too emotional for me, can I actually excuse myself from the day? Or I say, you must note, my cat has died. Once in a while, you might see a, sh a tear shedding at the corner of my eye. But the show goes on because I'm here and there's no other time for us to engage. Do you see that? I'm affected. I'm not saying that nothing has happened in my personal life. The same as I go out of here, you all make me very upset by using your phones while I am speaking and the, uh, the WhatsApp pings, they go on, off, on, off, on, off. And then, then I go and, you know, my husband does just one thing and I'm like, yeah, you are also just like them. I'm unable to regulate to say that is what happened in that context, what is happening here. Okay, maybe I like my tea warm and that's how he makes it, but then, then he forgot to warm it up or I came late or whatever. Let's talk about the tea. We're not going to talk about the WhatsApp messages pinging. That happened there. So being able to appraise, perceive accurately, appraise and express emotions and we'll do some few exercises there. So emotional intelligence as a practical concept revolutionized the way people view intelligence. Obviously, uh, as I said, um, the, the IQ, the intellectual intelligent uh, coefficient, and then emotional uh, coefficient. So intelligence has traditionally been defined as the capacity to understand, learn, recall, think, rationally solve problems, and apply what one has learned, that's before, but then this capacity has conventionally been measured by cognitive intelligence. Um, that's, that's how it has been always on the scale. So for example, your, your Stanford Binet intelligence scales, your Veshla scales, and all of those, they give us a good inter, uh, indication of what is the potential or the aptitude of a person. With emotional intelligence, on the other hand, it's concerned with understanding yourself and others relating to people and adapting to and coping with immediate surrounding in order to be more successful in dealing with environmental events, demands. 
So I cannot say, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm an extreme introvert, so what I'm going to be doing is stand in front of you and then you ask me questions. When I am not shy enough to be answering them, I will answer them. Other than that, thank you very much. By the way, I'm an extreme introvert. There are people who know in this room how extreme of an introvert I am. But because I need to adapt to this environment, I need to be flexible in how I am engaging and interacting with people. I like my own office. I like my office being this way. Even at home, people know, yes, we are not at home. That is why you are at work. So it means I will need to adapt to how the office works and how I'm going to be engaging. But also at the same time, self-expressing. Maybe you are sharing an office with somebody who chews gum loudly. Uh, you know those people ne, that relieve stress from chewing gum, uh, making bubbles. Okay? Yes. Uh, you can just say, Mtase, uh, homeboy. Hey, I, 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 I hear you like, you really like your bubbles. And hey, that's quite a technique. But this, it does not work in terms of this environment. So, what about maybe you and I, we strike a deal? I will walk with you to the shop or the cafeteria, click away, click away, but in this environment so that we can both be focused, so that you are exercising assertiveness, you are exercising self-expression, and also you are being flexible to the environmental demands. Emotional intelligence is tactical, so it it's an immediate function functioning while cognitive uh, intelligence is strategic, so it's long-term. So the, the marriage of the two is very important. And then we also say EQ helps to predict success because it reflects how a person applies knowledge to the immediate situation. So that's, not, that's where you are not rigid and saying, but the textbook said, but the policy says, but this is how we did it last year, this is how we did it last week, and it worked. But that was last week. This week, it's coming back. Now how do we apply? How do we become flexible to this week? Because maybe this week, um, I will give an example, uh, your immediate example. This week, whoever decided to toy toy, and you applied the strategy that worked last week. But here now we have to be flexible and say, how do we think about this so that we can move on and apply ourselves? So in a way, to measure emotional intelligence is to measure one's common sense, the ability to get along with the, with the world. By the way, somebody said to me, but it's common sense. I said, common sense is not as common as you think. Yeah. The person says, but it's common sense. I said, no, 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 no. Common sense is not as common as you think. So just because you are able to think about it in that way, it does not mean that the next person is able to think about it that way. What about we assert ourselves or we express ourselves and we say, oh, no, no, I see that you want to do it this way, but have, have, have you thought about this? So that is emotional intelligence. And then when we say, have you thought about this? This is strategy. That is where the IQ comes in. In human relations, how do we see it? So why do some people have better psychological well-being than others? Why are some individuals better able to succeed in life than others? Why do certain people relate better to uh, than others? I have an example, and, and I'm not sure how accurate this is. I've not researched this. I've not put paper and pen to this, but it's my observation. There is a personality disorder in psychology that we call narcissism. Um, and there is what I call functional narcissism. 
And I think at the heart of functional narcissism is a narcissist who's highly emotionally intelligent. I'll tell you why. Because when you look at the symptoms or the you know, uh, criteria for a narcissist, a narcissist is somebody who, you know, him, they, him or her must be right all the time. Um, things must go their way. Uh, nobody is um, supposed to tell them what to do. Uh, they, uh, what do you call it, make other people feel that it's always their fault. Uh, so we call that gaslighting. So they will always turn around the argument. So always the argument, whenever it has started, somewhere, somehow, you've got to find yourself being at the fault. So that's, that's, that's a typical narcissist. And I've observed in um, companies, especially CEOs, uh, in, in high corporate levels, I, I, will, I will say, and, and I'm just really throwing my head in there, to say that I think most of them are narcissists. But some of them are functional narcissists because they've got the emotional intelligence about it to know how to handle their narcissism. So that's basically what we're talking about when we're saying, um, you know, people who relate or who are able to relate with other people better. So it's not that your innate character is not there, as an example that I gave you, my introversion, but how do I come to a space and function? These are different components uh, or factors of emotional intelligence, and I'm going to be uh, unpacking them a little bit uh, in the next slide. So we have the component of intrapersonal. This is very important. Self-knowledge and the relationship with yourself uh, and I'm not talking about narcissism here, but the relationship is with yourself, it's very, very, very important. Imagine I did not know that I was an introvert. And then, then I called, I, I, I get invited to a seminar after seminar after seminar after seminar after seminar. By the way, the difference is that um, an extrovert draws energy from being with others, for, from interacting while an introvert draws energy from introspection and also uh, some aloneness or withdrawing from, from others. So now if I did not have that knowledge and every invitation I say yes, 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 be just because my diary is empty. And then, then I wonder how come am I not performing so well? Actually, maybe the third day or the third seminar, I say, ish. I wish I was not going there. I just want to be alone. I'm tired of people. Uh, other people say, uh, I'm, I'm tired of peopleing. So doing people. You are tired of doing people. So if a, you, a person does not have a knowledge, some knowledge about themselves, you find yourself being frustrated in, in, in environments and also wonder how come you are not performing at your optimum and becoming productive, but because you are working against yourself. That's basically what it is. So in there, we've got self-regard, we've got emotional self-awareness, we've got assertiveness, we've got independence, we've got self-actualization. And as I said, I'm gonna highlight a few of them, not all the components, and I'm also going to do practical examples with a few of them. And then, then we've got the interpersonal factor. The interpersonal factor is where you've got empathy. So now, uh, let's say uh, my manager is uh, Prof. Kunong, uh, Dr. Kunong, and I come in and I say, my cat died. And he's like, Mara, go buy another one. <laughs> ne? Um, and, and I'm even going to say this in Sotho. You are crying for a kid. Okay? So, meaning that she is not being empathetic to my situation. Because maybe for her, cat might even represent bad omen, for that matter. Maybe she's even happy inside to say, hey, she's been coming with cat fair to, the, to work and I've been sneezing. I'm glad that cat is gone. But in our human relations, she is not able to act in that way. 
She can empathize and say, Ish, I know what your cat meant. For you, it was your companion. It kept you, um, you know, uh, quite in engaged and happy because you stay alone. Hey, I'm sorry. But she can be like, God, thank you for answering my prayers. Amen. But the empathy element of it needs to be there. Social responsibility, so that's where we reach out to others who are less privileged than us or who are needing our assistance, and then interpersonal relations. And then we've got another component, which is adaptability component, where we talk about reality testing. So let's say Prof comes to this unit, and he, she comes with big changes that are unrealistic to attain. She will be shooting herself in the foot, and she might even have a sense of failure in herself because when she looked at the unit and her ambition, it did not match the unit and where the unit is. So that is the reality testing. It's very important. Flexibility as well. Where I thought, OK, we are going to be presenting inside, but only to find that we need to present outside. As an emotionally intelligent person, I can't say, I have spent three days preparing my slides. You make sure that I have an in indoor um, um, auditorium so that you can see my slide. As an emotionally intelligent person, I'll be like, OK, I've prepared my slides. But clearly, we are doing it outdoors. This is my work. I'm going to be engaging. Problem solving as well goes hand in hand. Stress management component. This is very important as well. So your stress tolerance, you need to know yourself. You need to know how much you can stretch up to. You need to also know how, how much you are unable to. Sometimes you will find that, um, and we, 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 we call that obviously uh, resilience, the ability to bounce back. You find that your resilience is much more because you've got a lot of resources and support. So you come up, up, up against challenges and challenges after challenges and challenges, but because of the support that you have and the resources that you have, they help mitigate against those challenges that you are facing. And as I said, that we call then resilience. So you find that another person is able to tolerate much higher stress than the next. I remember during COVID-19, uh, we opened throughout uh, the, the whole COVID-19, the practice actually thrived and grew. And this person made a comment. She was like, oh my goodness, you keep on bouncing back. And I looked at, at it, and for me, it's, it's, uh, it's no brainer. Oh, it was no brainer. I did not have to work very hard to bounce back. But I looked at what did I put in place to help me to tolerate the stress. One of the things could be good sleep. I cannot emphasize that any much more than I can say it now. By the way, I'm going to be specializing in, in sleep uh, in, in, in a while. I'm getting accreditation for that. And the importance of sleep in a human being. Actually, sometimes you find that some, a, a person comes and they tell me what they're dealing with. And then they say, I also suffer from insomnia. I say, let's start there. Because when we deal with sleep, then it helps you to be sharp as well, cognitively. Because when you are not sleeping enough, you are forgetful, uh, you are irritable. Um, there is actually a hormone called, if I'm not mistaken, lapacin. It is only produced during sleep. And it's the hormone that tells us that we are full, by the way, that we are, our stomach is full. So meaning that if we are not sleeping enough, that lapisin is not activated in our brains, and we cannot get the sensation that we are full. So I'm just saying, lethargic as well. That's what you find in sleep. I find people making so many mistakes with the absence of sleep. Um, research has shown that people who are sleep deprived, they, are, they can be equated to people who are mildly intoxicated. So meaning that when you are sleep deprived, a person who just got from the nightclubs on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you on the road, you are the same. You are not different. 
you are exactly the same and I can show you research after research after research. Maybe one day I will come back and speak about sleep, just the importance of sleep. I'm talking here or highlighting the stress tolerance because in how you manage stress, it is actually because of the work, the underlying work that you will have done to be able to tolerate the stress, the support system. What kind of support system do you have? Is it an overcritical support system or is it a system where you feel you are not judged? Do you have a place to go to where you can have solace, where you can be grounded, where you can be rooted? That is a support system. Eating habits, I will not go there. I'm not a nutri nutritionist, but I know how eating impacts on my performance, for example. If I have certain foods at a certain time of the day, by 11 o'clock when I'm in consultation with you, you will be sure I'll be micro-sleeping. <laughs> it's a fact. And I had to manage that. I had to look at that. Oh, what did I eat? There we go. And then now you are suffering abandonment issues and issues of feeling unloved and unwanted. And here I am, your psychologist micro-sleeping in the session. It's talking to productivity. Okay? Impulse control as well. Um, that's in that uh, uh, the, the stress management component. So the impulse control will be, you know, I'm stressed. Where do I go? There's a, which mall is the closest to you, Nisa? Brooklyn, Brooklyn Mall. They call it, uh, sh is it shop therapy? therapy? Mm -hmm. retail. retail, thank you, retail therapy. And when you get home, after three months, you wonder, wh why was I even buying that shoe? It even has a tag, by the way. And then, then the general mood component where we're talking optimism, we're talking happiness. So the sense of fulfillment, a sense of you know, um, purpose as well, it also applies here. Because if you don't have a purpose about whatever you're doing, there's no way you are going to be happy. You are going to be disgruntled. I said one day um, to one employee, um, she was complaining about her employment, as we all do. As I said, as we all do. So she was complaining about her employment, about the pay, and so on. And I looked straight in her eyes. I say, as an employee, you can never be paid enough. Mm. Ever. Whatever promotion, whatever level, you can never. As an employee, you can never be paid enough. I said... Poor person, start selling to augment your salary. Start consulting to augment your salary. Start doing some side hustle to augment your salary because as an employee, you can never have enough. And then, then with that, uh, and, and this was a different employee. So I'm talking to the sense and the purpose. So she, she has lost purpose in the work that she do. She, she, she's a chartered accountant and she does not want to do it anymore. But then she is in the meantime. So in the meantime, what do we do? Because she has applied for work elsewhere. She has not gotten work. And I said, by the way, sometimes it's a matter of perception and perspective. I said, I'm going to give you three weeks sick leave. She was like, ah, but I'm going to go and then I'm going to come back to the same work. I say, yes, the work is going to be the same, but you're going to be different after three weeks. I will tell you what. I want you, as you are on your three weeks sick leave, and go away to the bush or something like that. I want you to say, right now you are consulting with me. How much is your workplace subsidizing that consultation? Because this person is on medical aid, ne? How much is your work enabling you, your work that you are complaining about, enabling you to consult with a psychologist? Let's start there. Number two, I am giving you leave 
out of the three weeks, I mean, out of the four weeks, you will be working one week. How much of your salary are they going to be paying you? 100% full four weeks. I said, if I go on vacation, I'm going with the vacation. You, when you are going on vacation for three weeks, they'll be paying you for four weeks. So I want you to go away. Yes, your workplace will not have changed, but your perception will have. So you'll be coming in with a different perspective about what actually your work is. Yes, you have lost purpose, and I empathize with that, and I understand you while you are looking, but right now we are talking about in the meantime space, and that is emotional intelligence. So the self-perception, we can talk about self-regard, the ability to look and understand it yourself, respect and accept yourself, accept your perceived positive and negative aspects as well as your limitations and possibilities. It's very, very important to do this. You cannot want to be something or someone else where your abilities cannot take you. It's going to be very frustrating and you're going to frustrate others around you. So how it looks like in the workplace, employees who can, with high self-regard, have better work attitude and behaviors, better self-confidence, and also it means better performance. Because they know, I'm, I'm not a numbers person, as an example, but I might know that Dr. Kuno is a numbers person. So we do a report, we analyze, we finish, and then I say, okay, I'll do all the words, and then can you do all the graphs and the numbers? And now we are accomplished and we are productive as a team because I have recognized my limitations. I don't be like, yeah, I'm going to publish this alone because I want them to see that it was my work. <laughs> I'm going to be frustrated. Yeah. Emotional self-awareness, the ability to recognize and understand one's feelings and emotions, differentiate between them and know what caused them and why. So I might say, but Christine's cat died last week, and she was at work, and she was happy, she was fine. Why am I crying the whole day on a Monday? I could not even ask for sick leave because I thought they would uh, label me and victimize me to say, there goes a, 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 a Monday absent person. But then, then only to find that Christine Christine's cat has been sick for a while, and Christine has three or four other family members around her. I'm alone with my cat, and my cat was a form of companion. So now I have an understanding, oh, that is why. Why am I triggered on Mother's Day while other people are celebrating Mother's Day? Why do I hate Mother's Day? Oh, no, I remember. Maybe that's the day I had a miscarriage because I was hoping that I would be a mother. So do you see, you need to understand where those emotions are coming from. We cannot just have them from out of nowhere. Now we can even mitigate. I have an employee. She works in a unit, uh, and it's a research um, space, multinational company. She has been trying to conceive for a while, uh, her and her husband. And we recently had breakthrough. I've been seeing her for more than a year and a half. Um, there was trauma years, there was um, uh, illnesses and, 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 and losses in her family. We dealt with that. And she says, I don't know how come I cannot motivate myself to be productive at my work. Remember I said they've been trying to conceive for a while, only to find that her project, her main focus of the project is on termination of pregnancy. Okay? So she is trying to conceive. Here she is interviewing ladies after ladies, woman after woman, gathering data for the research on termination of pregnancy. So it's a constant trigger for her. So whenever she thinks about work, she thinks about 
she actually resents the people who make the choice. And this is her professional space where she needs to be non-judgmental and she needs to be partial. She needs to be not, uh, not be subjective and be very objective. But here she is. So I was like, okay, can you then go speak to your supervisor and ask him or her to put you on another um, focus area in your work? In the workplace, good emotional self-awareness promotes successful conflict resolution and leads to improved interaction between staff. So imagine now, I understand, oh, that is why I hate Mother's Day. Now I'm not going to be fighting with everybody in the office. I'm just going to be saying, okay, I know you are celebrating Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Can you excuse me? Those are good collegial relations. Self-actualization, the ability to realize one's potential, capabilities, and to strive to do that which one wants to do and enjoys doing. In the workplace, high self-actualization is connected with good motivation and striving to optimize both individual and team performance. A, a well-rounded individual brings more life experience to the job. The self-expression is very, very, very important when it comes to emotional intelligence. So emotional expression openly expresses one's feeling verbally and non-verbally. But this is not done to the negative impact of the others. Just because you want to express your emotions, you're not just going to express them just like that. It has to be done in a way that both parties feel like they are regarded as equals in that space. Assertiveness, so assertiveness is a very important component of self-expression. So when you express yourself, you don't express yourself in an um, aggressive way. So we've got what we call um, uh, uh, um, passive-aggressive and also uh, aggressive. In assertive, you are at all costs able to uh, express your feelings, beliefs, thoughts, and defend your rights in a non-destructive way. So it, the aim is not to make the other person know who you are and where to get off. It is to be heard and also to listen as well. So how it looks like in the workplace, Proper assertive helps individuals to work more cohesively and to share ideas effectively. Good leaders have well-developed assertiveness skills. So this is how it might look like as a supervisor or a manager. You've got a team and they have not delivered on what you have asked them. So you don't go because you need to ask, express yourself and say, but I needed this to be done yesterday. Why is it not done? You say, can I have an understanding of where the deadline needed to be uh, um, um, uh, adhered to? And what is it that maybe was in the way of that? So in so many words, you have actually said, you guys have run out of time, but I need to understand. Only to find that maybe the Wi-Fi was off. So you have that understanding, but you have also expressed yourself that next time, please do communicate when such things happen. Independence, the ability to be self-reliant and self-directed in one's thinking and actions and be free of emotional dependency. This people may ask for and consider the advice of others, but they really depend in others to make important decisions or do things for, for them. So in the workplace, this is how it looks like. The proper balance is for people to think for themselves and yet still listen to and utilize ideas from others when appropriate. So we are saying that this is not a person who would be asking, I've done this or I, I want to do this. What do you think all the time? What do you think? Did, did I do the right thing? Did I tell her the right thing? Did I make the right? No, 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 no. You need to think independently and say, this is what I've done. I'm hoping this was correct, but I am also willing to be corrected if maybe this was not correct. This is an independent thinker. And then, then with the interpersonal, 
I think I will just touch on the empathy one. So the ability to be effective to and understand and to appreciate the feelings of others. It is being able to emotionally read other people. So to say, oh, I see that you are down today. Not to say, I see you are down, is it me? No, 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 that's not empathy. What did I do wrong? That's not emotional intelligence, that's insecurity. Ne? Because you are already making an assumption that something that is wrong has to do with you. So you just say, you know, you are not yourself today, or do you need space, or do you need a moment? I know you like people around, but how would you like for us to treat this situation? Would you like to go home? So that is empathy. So as I said, with Dr. Kunong and my cat dying, she can pray her silent prayer inside and say, thank you, Lord, for killing that cat. It was making me sneeze every day when I come. <laughs> oh, Shem, I'm very sorry about your cat. I know how much you liked it. And then maybe she can advise, maybe get a something next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, dog also, they will sneeze, you sneeze. If you've got allergies, you've got allergies. <laughs> Decision making, problem solving. So the ability to identify, define a problem as well as generate, implement potentially effective solutions. Potentially effective solutions. You don't put a problem, that is an emotionally intelligent person, you don't put a problem and not come with possible solutions. We are in a workplace. We are, we've got minds. So it goes back to the independent thinking. So when you come with a problem, yes, you might not have all the solutions to whoever that you're talking with, be it your team, your subordinate, your superiors, but you can say, I think based on whatever worked then, this might work better. In a workplace, the method used for problem solving is critical, viable alternative solution must be considered, including a cost-benefit analysis and long-term implications. I was listening to the acting CEO of, C, uh, of SAA, uh, Mr. Thomas Kokolo, last week, I think it was Thursday, on Clemens Magnatella show. And he was talking about the route, SAA route to Devon, and he said he had to challenge the government a lot because the government was like, why aren't we opening the SAA Devon route? Because in the mind is that all of us as South Africans, we go to Devon uh, to go uh, for the beach and so on. And because he's got a background in uh, chartered accountancy, he gave them the numbers and then they fought back. He gave them the numbers, he fought back. He says, when you can find and come back with different numbers, we'll discuss the Devon Jobek route. So do you see the problem solving? It does not negate another person's solution. It says if your solution is cost-benefit analysis and it's implica uh, implementable, then let's listen to it. Reality testing, the ability to assess uh, the correspondence between what is expected, so the subjective, and what is, real, reality, uh, what is in reality existing. So the objective. So in a workplace, the focus should be on practically and not unrealistic expectation. And I think I've made that example earlier on. Impulse control, the ability to resist or delay an impulse, drive, or temptation to act. Sometimes we just want to act now. And I made an example with retail therapy earlier on. Stress tolerance. And I think here I really want to talk to you a little bit about some of um, those tips that we were sharing earlier on. So the ability to withstand adverse events and stress situation without falling apart and confidently coping with the stress. And as I'm making examples with the workplace in terms of how it looks like, you can also translate them into your home life and also into the society because it will be the same. You have financial stresses or financial pressures or children growing up into, um, you know, from teenage to young adults or from um, uh, preteens to teenage. So you can be thinking of how do we manage or how do we handle the stressors in, in our lives. But as I said, I think for me, what is important is what you have in your reservoir. So the ability to handle that stress is if you're already emotionally depleted, chances are 
when stress builds, that you are going to be knocked off. And that is when we call burn, burn out. When burn out happens, it's where there was no balance between what we will say intermittent rest. So the intermittent rest could be your daily. The daily is taking a break in your work. If your work is structured, you come into the office at 8, you take a break at 11 for uh, 15, 20 minutes, you come back to your desk, you do some work, you, you take another break at 1 for lunch for 30 minutes, and then, then you come back to your desk and then you keep on uh, doing your work. And then maybe even on your way home to be able to break that space, um, listening to music and audio, uh, chatting to a friend, catching up on something, and then so that you are breaking from that stress of the environment of work into the home environment and even in traffic. Because what happened can also affect the society on the road. So that's number one. That's on a daily basis. The number two will be the sleep, as I've already emphasized. As human beings, we need an average of seven hours per day. So anything between six and eight, anything more than that or less than that, it is not good for us. I know and I accept there are people who will say to me, and I've also said that to myself, I can do with sleep. Four hours, I am sorted. I agree with you. It's just like a person who has not worn glasses, but they have bad vision. You will not know. So meaning that I accept your four to five hours and your three hours, I accept it. But until you sleep, you will not know. OK? So it, there's a lot of things that happen, and I can go technical into that. It's about the circadian rhythm. It's about the REM, the uh, rhythmic um, uh, eye movement. Uh, it's about the, the brain resting and the body, because remember, the brain does not rest in our sleep. That is why we dream. The brain does not rest. It integrates information. It concretizes everything. It crystallizes everything that you have experienced in your day, in your life. It co makes connections. That is why then you dream biting somebody because you were angry. <laughs> so you are busy resolving your anger that you could not manifest during the day because it's not socially acceptable. So you need to resolve it in the dream. So now if you don't sleep enough, you will wake up angry the next day because that anger was not resolved in the dream. <laughs> you did not give your brain chance enough to say, all right, step one, okay, we are in La La Land, we are feeling good, our bodies are resting, okay, step two, uh, who is there? Oh, knock, knock, mother-in-law, oh, mother-in-law, okay, hello, all right. Oh, who is there? Prof. Oh, Prof. What did Prof do? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but if we are intercepting, that process does not happen. Um, our circadian rhythm, it goes into 30 minutes and 60 minutes slots. And for us to be able to go into deep sleep, we need to at least have about five of those circadian, circadian rhythms. As I said, I can go a little bit technical into that, but sleep is very important on a daily. Yes, I know sometimes there's crunch times, there's deadlines, there's exams, there's times where there's a mounting pressure and that is acceptable. You will be able to catch up, but it must not be chronic. And then, then the other intermittent uh, resting that I want to talk about is taking a break. And when I'm talking about taking a break, uh, so last year they asked me uh, in the office, are you going to take a holiday? I say, no, 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 I'm not going to take a holiday because my whole family is coming. <laughs> I'm not going to take leave. My whole family is coming to my house. Yeah. Yeah. That's so I'm not taking leave. I'll, I'll, I'll still come to the office. Because what that means is that your family, your whole family, 
uh, 23 of us to be exact in one space for 14 days. It means dishes, cleaning, running after kids, cleaning them, all of that. Ne? And then I said, no, 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 no. Uh, should COVID, COVID permit and we are able to travel, I will go away for two weeks or three weeks. That is a break. But you can determine your own break at your own time. You know what works for you, you know what does not. So uh, before, before the, the, the kids and the whatever situation, uh, what used to happen in holidays is either spring cleaning or cleaning the roof. Ne? That's how holy, that was what holidays was used for. It was not for resting, it was spring cleaning. So the intermittent resting is very important. Scheduling it, it's even more important. Where you can schedule it, whether it's two or three times a year, where you say, okay, five days in April, I'm going to the bush, and then three days in September, I'm going to the sea, and then two days, I'm gonna make sure that I am on leave when it's school time, so that I take the kids home uh, to school, and then, then I can rest, not during school holidays. That's not the rest, okay? And you can hear uh, who's speaking. It's a mother of very young children. <laughs> so that is also that building the reservoir. Another building of reservoir to help you to be tolerant of the stress is also journaling. Journaling can help to just unpack and express and download our thoughts. One of the techniques that I use when I help people with the sleep is to say, download your thoughts. So before you sleep, because you find that uh, people ruminate and you know, the counting of sheep, it's about this and that and that and that, but when you download them, when you write them down, then you find that it helps. And then, then a, a proper, proper uh, supportive sy uh, support system. And then, then I talked about the element of happiness, the ability to be, feel satisfied with one's life, to enjoy oneself and being with others, and also to have fun. I know in life we need to be serious. We need to take life seriously and we need to take ourselves seriously, or else life is not gonna take us seriously. But have pockets of fun things. You know what is fun for you. Fun for the next person might not be fun for the other person. Um, yeah, I wanted to tell you what I did for fun. It was my birthday last week, Wednesday, and I thank you, and I did something that uh, I never thought I would enjoy it, but I actually, um, yeah, did enjoy it. Hot air ballooning and just looking at the world floating slowly. It was very enjoyable. And I was like, oh, this is what life is made of. Sun rising, you know, seeing the other balloon, and that you know, because I, I was so guilty, I was feeling so guilty about that indulgent. And I was like, but we work every day, you know? So why not? So the mental models, you remember I showed a number of pictures and you all could say something about uh, that particular person. So um, this is Keegan, uh, Robert Keegan. He's a pioneer of adult development and learning. He said that all people are involved in the activity of making meaning of their world. There is thus no feeling, no experience, no thought, no perception independent of the meaning-making context in which it becomes a feeling, an experience, a thought, a perception, because we are the meaning-making context. So I flashed, um, I'm looking for somebody that you all had different ideas about. Okay, Malema, yes. I flashed Malema on the board, and others said radical, others said leader, others said um, he, um, courageous. And that's because of your context. Whatever context you find yourself in, whatever experiences that you have maybe had about him, or knowing him, or hearing about him, you will form an opinion, a particular mental model. I want you to think of your space, your work environment. What mental model do you have about your unit? What mental model do you have about your colleagues? 
What mental model do you have about your superiors? What mental models do you have about your subordinates? What mental models do you have about the institution? I will, I will, be, I will be the one to start. I'll be explicit. Uh, I was at Tekis, I studied there, graduated there, taught there. So I was at Tekis plus minus 20, 22, 23 years. I still went to Tegis every day having a mental model that Tegis is racist. Even though I studied there, so meaning Tegis nourished me, Tegis made me to be a professional that I am, Tegis gave me the qualifications that I have, I thrived in Tegis as an academic, I had a number of mentees that I'm still very fond of and still working the journey with, but yet my mental model. What is the context in which that mental model comes from? What are my experiences? Have I had explicit or implicit experiences about what I held as Tegis, a mental model, is racist? Do you see how sometimes we hold on to mental models, but yet we don't question where they come from. We don't uh, unpack them, we don't scrutinize where that is coming from. But because coming from a township and coming into this uh, uh, ivory tower, so especially our building, the humanities, it's actually literally an ivory tower, that's the mindset I hold about it. Came 2016, fees must fall. You all know what happened. I still held very dearly my mental model. When Lanewood Gate closed, the main gate, I was like, this is crazy. For what? For the who? Closing knowledge inside. Because you will go, I mean, as scholars, you will go sometimes overseas to conferences, you know, to many, many universities. The neighborhood is in the university, or the university is in the neighborhood. There's no demarcation, there's no separation. A person in the neighborhood could easily go into the library. And I said, this is, um, and, and I'm going to say it like it is, I, I thought the Tekis was afraid of Swart Khafar by closing Lanewood Gate. So is Tegis that afraid of the EFFs? <laughs> Let's put it there. <laughs> that much that they will close the main gate, main entrance to the knowledge setting. That's, I made all of that conclusion based on what? My mental model. Do you see how powerful? mental models are. Mental models are deeply ingrained assumptions. So this is Peter Seng, the fifth discipline. He says, mental models are deeply ingrained assumptions, generalizations, or even pictures or images that influence how we understand the world and take action. Very often, we are not consciously aware of our mental models or the effect they have on our behavior. So now let's imagine, I go around thinking, Tekis as an institution is racist. What will be my behavior in terms of trying to thrive and strive for excellence? What do you think? Hmm? Negative, yes. So meaning that I will put that as an excuse because it's a, my mental model to go up the ladder and say, that is why I will never be promoted. That is why my paper was not accepted. That is why my promoter did not defend me in my PhD. Do you see? That's how powerful our mental models are. And that is why we need to scrutinize them. They are effective and efficient. 
So mental models are efficient and effective. They are efficient because they represent um, uh, excellent times, they, they, they are excellent time savers, basically, for the brain when needing to make a decision and act quickly. Simple example is if, and we're talking South Africa, we're not talking Switzerland or Sweden ne? or Finland, we're talking South Africa. If I'm walking through the bush in South Africa and I, in, at night, and I hear rattling, Okay. Do I do I be like, who is there? No. Uh, we can work together. We can stroll together. We run. That's our mental model without even wanting to ask questions. That's because of what we know about our country. But the same if I was doing in Switzerland or Sweden, I was walking through the forest, and I hear the rattling. I'll be like, oh. Oh, it's foxes in the forest. <laughs> Maybe as a South African, I might run two or three times until I see that there's no harm. Okay? So that is why we say they are efficient and they are also effective. They are subtle but yet powerful. They are subtle. Like, where is that mental model about me saying take is, is racist coming from. It's very, very subtle. It's certain things that has crept on throughout the age. As I said, I have not explicitly encountered or experienced, so there's subtlety, but yet very powerful in how they can determine and also influence behavior. So they're subtle because we usually are unaware of their effect they are powerful because they determine what we pay attention to and therefore what we also do. Mental models are strongly conservative, so if they are left unchanged, and I think I want to emphasize this, especially in, as, 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 as you work together, as you keep living life or doing lives together. So they are strongly conservative, left unchallenged, they will cause us to see what we have always seen. Nothing different. They will cause us to see what we have always seen. The same needs, the same opportunity, the same results, and because we see what our mental models permit us to see, we do what our mental models permit us to do. So if I already have a mental model about superiority or leadership, so let, uh, uh, I have a client who has had a chaotic childhood and an abusive father, so father authority. He is a senior manager, and yet he cannot assert himself with his colleagues. Because authority to him means shut up, you are no good, what good do you bring, critical, all of that. And he, I'm helping him now to challenge that mental model. And he has been practicing that and coming a little bit closer. So we will always do what we have done because we see what we have always seen if we don't challenge them. The problem with mental models arise when they become implicit when they exist below the level of our awareness, so especially when you are not aware of your mental model. Because we remain unaware of our mental models, the models remain unexamined. So if I am able to search to say, but Tekis has nourished you, has promoted you, has done one, two, three, four, five, or that other client where I say, but your workplace has enabled you to access psychological services. It has helped you to pay your bond on a monthly basis. It is helping you to go for leisurely trips once in a while. And now we are examining this mental model about work. Now what does work mean? Work means access. It means comfort. It means expressing my potential. So because they are unexamined, the models remain unchanged 
As the world changes, the gap widens between our mental models and reality, leading to increasingly counter... And I can't... I, there's no founding evidence for my mental model. The world keeps changing, but I hold on to my mental model. I'll be lost. I'll be counterproductive. I'll be instigating. I'll be influencing. I'll be saying to people, upcoming academics, don't stay at the geese because. But all of that is unfounded. So we say that emotional intelligence can enhance organizational effectiveness. It can enhance, and I know that I wrote uh, in enhancing because I wanted to make a couple of examples, but in the interest of time, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna skip those examples. So it can enhance organizational effectiveness. It can enhance uh, the um, relational self, um, uh, uh, relationship with self. It can also broaden their self-awareness and also enhance personal relations, be it at home, be it in the society. I wanted us to just look at a practical example and looking at self-expression. That would be the first example, and maybe we can look at uh, one or two uh, assertiveness uh, or boundaries um, or e even emotional uh, awareness with the time that we are left with. So when we look at the um, self-expression or, or managing our, our emotions, it's about gathering the information. Okay, so now that I've gathered information, how do I interpret the information? So I will always interpret the information according to the lenses in which I see the world. And I need to also scrutinize those lenses. If I'm wearing pink shaded lenses and I am in a blue room, I cannot keep on saying, but this room is turquoise. It's because I'm wearing pink shade, this room is blue, and the combination between the two makes turquoise or lilac or whatever color that comes from that combination. And we can say, from interpreting that information gathered, am I factual or is it just an interpretation according to my own experience? We also generate feelings from that based on my experience. Oh, I love the color purple. Okay, now it makes sense. Decide an in, uh, intended expression and then, then express that feeling. So when we come to step one, let's say we gather information about the room. Uh, people are sitting down. They are listening to a, um, a, a speaker. And immediately as I come into the room, as people are sitting down and listening to the speaker, uh, they go out in a loud chuckle. And then I come in, I've got low self-esteem. So you're just coming in. So, sorry, you just came in. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm just realizing. <laughs> At least we did not chuckle. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so you're just coming in. So gathering information. You're looking at them, they just chuckled, and you've got low self-esteem. Interpretation might be, they are laughing at me. Do you see? And now you need to scrutinize this moment and say, am I factual about what I'm interpreting, or is it because of the inner self? And remember where the work of self-awareness is important. Okay, I'm already having a bad day, and people are making jokes, but I need to realize they are not being insensitive. It's just that I am having a bad day. Do you see how that process works? So you will need to interpret it, generate the feelings of what it is, and then say, am I accurate in judging this in this way to say, oh, it's three times that I'm bringing this report, and she says the report is crap. Is this fact that my report is crap, or are we now personal about the issues? Okay, let me take it to another colleague, maybe in the same position. Ish. 
the colleague looks at it and says, hey, what were you smoking when you were writing this report? <laughs> okay, it is not personal. My report, it was that time when my mother died and I was going through something and I was trying to put a report together. Now I understand it was my emotions in the way I was trying to hit a deadline. Self-regulation, emotional self-regulation, self-awareness, interpreting, and then looking, is, are these facts or is that me? And then I said there's a difference between aggressive, passive aggressive, and assertiveness. Many people, when we talk about assertiveness, they think it's just asserting yourself, you know, putting yourself in things and forcing people to accept you no matter what. Part of it, it is expressing yourself, but it's not expressing yourself at the detriment of the other person. So le let's look at it. So uh, I've put an acronym there, letter approach to assertiveness. Look at your rights and what you want and understand your feelings about the situation. What are your rights? So you want to be assertive. Whenever you ask for leave, they say no. And now you want to start to be assertive. What is your right? Do you have a right to leave? Do you not have a right to leave? Arrange a meeting with the other person to discuss the situation. Okay, for three times previously, I have asked for leave, but the leave was not granted. I was always told that it is a busy time of the year, but I'm wondering if this time around, it's still a busy time of the year because now it means every time of the year, it's going to be a busy time of the year. Because the three previous times were busy time of the year. So that's the meeting. Ne? So now you're defending the problem specifically. Exactly how I've put it. I've asked for leave. The past three times, I was told it was a busy time of the year. When is it not a busy time of the year? And then maybe the other person says, in December. Oh, unfortunately, in December, this is the situation with me, and therefore, it is not considered as restful time. I go to my in-laws, we cook in three food pots, in the sun, on the ground fire, and it means when I come back in January, I am not productive at my work. So meaning that taking leave in December, it's actually counterproductive for all of us, not only for me, but for all of us for what we want to achieve. Describe your feelings so that other person fully understand how you feel about the situation, express what you want clearly and concisely. So can I be granted leave in May? I understand that it is a busy time, but because I'm telling you now, in the first week of April, maybe give me the work that you know is going to congest that time so that I can push and it's not so busy. Do you hear ne? the negotiation? We are not attacking each other. We are not screaming. We are negotiating based on what is my right? How am I feeling? How is this going to benefit us? Reinforce the other person by explaining the mutual benefits of adopting the side of action you are suggesting, especially that. You usually get a buy-in of other people when you can say, what is it in it for them as well? So you can say, yes, I can come to work. Um, I'm feeling ill, I can come to work, but know that now and then I'll be going to the toilet because my tummy is really running. So would you like for somebody who's gonna be half, more than half of the day on the bucket, or I would rather be at the bucket at home. Which bucket would you like for me to use? Okay? So rather being your thoughts and emotions, be the awareness behind them. Do not just be your thoughts. We will see with you what are you thinking and what are you feeling. Have the awareness. This is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling this injustice. I'm feeling that there's an unfairness, and I want us to work this through. And then we say, with the thoughts and emotions, only 36% of people 
are able to accurately identify their emotions, by the way. I never thought I got angry in life. I thought I'm a very peaceful person that I never got angry until I learned what my body does when I'm angry. That's the only time I knew that I do get angry. Um, I will skip this one, the Jahari window, but that's one way of helping us to get to know ourselves um, and increasing self-awareness. But to end this off, I'm just going to help you with emotional self-awareness because, as I said, some of you, you think you don't feel certain emotions, but sometimes it could be that when our bodies does a certain thing or react a certain way that we realize, ah, I did not know that I am actually envious or jealous or angry or frustrated or bitter or resentful until the dream where you are biting somebody happens. Then you realize, oh, actually I've been harboring so much anger within me that is unresolved, that is not expressed. How, what can I do with it? If you can direct them at the person, then you talk to the person. If that person is somebody that is unapproachable, you write about it or you take it to your therapist or a friend uh, to talk about that, but at least you will have been able to express those. So this is some of the ways in which you can help to identify your internal emotions. So the happy, the sad, so internal signals, I can tell that I'm feeling this way when this happens. And then external cues, my partner or my best friend can tell that I'm feeling this way when that happens. With that, I'm hoping that we are now aware of ourselves and how that can be used to relate to one another. And as I said, it does not take anything away from yourself, but at least with you knowing yourself to say, this is how I step into a situation or an environment, then I'm able to communicate to say, today, this is what is happening. I will not be able to do this. Or actually, I'm very excited. I can push myself and I can uh, uh, stretch myself uh, beyond uh, what is asked from me. Thank you. Left with one minute. Thank you. One minute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Menkate um, Kondala Mahoro. Indeed, I'm I'm just overwhelmed because uh, you went beyond my expectations. And uh, what what resonates with me so well is the mental models. If the mental models remain unchanged they are likely going to cause harm. That, to me, it, it, it stands out. Um, our VP is here. I don't know if uh, our VP is going to sit for 15 minutes for question time, or you just want to greet, and then we do question time. You want to greet. Menkate um, Komahoro. In the meantime, Menomaza, where are you? I want us, because this is something that is um, very sensitive, we, we, we are going to issue out papers. You write your question down. I'm, I'm trying to have a protected situation. Remember, I told you that my niche area of research is wellness. And I worked in the correctional context with the juveniles, where sometimes some of the things are so sensitive that you do not want them to voice them out, but to say right. And in the writings, I found out more data compared to the interviews. And uh, even in this environment, because we are talking EQ, we are talking work-related relationships. I want us to protect one another. I'm, I'm a specialist of wellness. So I know what it can do, if at all I can say, um, Dr. Makhatukuno, ask your question. Then you say, yeah, prof, 
Yeah, actually they're talking about you as my line manager. I, I hope you have listened so well that as from tomorrow, things are going to change in our office. I don't want that. I'm a specialist of wellness and I worked in very sensitive context of a prison where the prison warder will be parading while you interview the inmates. And they want to tell you, they, their minds, they are, they are full of information. But because the prison warder is parading with a baton in the hand and a gun on the side, then they say, Ish Mamzo, Ish Ya, no, no. It's bad, Ish Ya, Hwashwe Wamu, yo. Then you, you give the person a piece of paper, they write. I got so many things that I was able to do also transformation in the correctional schools. Uh, currently, they're using the model. So, uh, there are pieces of papers here. While our VP is greeting, then you issue them out to all of us, even myself, and uh, you might be having a question to yourself. And then, <laughs> the, these are the papers. And then our honorable VP will be coming forward to greet us. Our vice principal is my line manager. Her name is Ntombizoto, and I get her home context. When they, when they named her Ntombizoto, I think, oh, she comes from a family of girls only. <laughs> Five. Five. Whoa. Yeah. And then I, I think she might be the fifth child. Yes. If they no, said Sixth. Six. Six. There's a boy, number two, and then. And then girls. Then me, then so girl number five. So they were having many girls. Then they said, don't be Zodra, girls only. Me, VP is our vice principal, teaching, learning, community engagement, and student support. I interacted with her quite a, some years back when I had the transformation workshop in the College of Education. I would tap on her brain and intelligence, and she was always helpful. I remember even the day when we organized the Women's Day in the College of Education, I said, ma'am, come and empower us in the, as women only in the College of Education. She came, she empowered us. And then we engaged more while she was still working in Ethiopia as the director. Uh, and they were only masters and doctoral students. I sat under her tutelage. I listened to her presentations. I listened to her. Uh, the way she directed the whole campus in Ethiopia. She's a very resilient woman. Ethiopia is not penetrable, but when a leader of a woman of a caliber is able to lead that campus to its success, because we had many graduates of masters and gra uh, doctoral students, I could see that dynamite comes in small packages. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to <laughs> Mayor Prof. Mozart to greet us. Thank you very much, my leader, dynamite under the, the banner of the Lord Almighty. You, you can't do it alone. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am in the, in the middle of my own flu journey, so you will pardon me. Um, I want to start with an audition because, <laughs> because he's here. I told him even uh, two years ago that I want to be YV before they took, <laughs> they took off um, Rhythm City. Um, yes, I'm a theatre person, but I critique theatre of the world. I critique. Um, I tried acting until I remembered my own personal character while on stage. And the director said, cut, you are not in character. Oosh, then I stopped. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome um, our honorable guests. We are very honored as a university. We feel very, very respected by yourselves. You don't come easy, I know. But because this is the only university that has your country's name, you really felt that you have to 
come in and lend a hand and we build our university. Um, I, I wish to also thank the executive director, Memahanu, that's what we call her. This is not a family, so I won't use Rahadi and other things, no. <laughs> thank you very much, Prof. Um, colleagues, it is not just a matter of compliance that we need to be healthy. It is a matter of survival for us human beings. By compliance, I mean that it is not just because the Ministry of Higher Education says that uh, there is toxic culture in universities. Therefore, we need to try and rid ourselves of this destructive energy, this destructive poison amongst ourselves. It is not just because of that. That is very important. But more than anything, <clears throat> we are social beings. We cannot survive without one another. We really cannot. Just look at um, a span of cattle. I don't know. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. I, I, I grew up not in the farms, but in my pantheon. Not in the farms, the Amaplas are fine. They are very westernized. I mean real rural, where you wake up, you call in a span of about six um, oxen. You don't put a bull there because bulls have attitudes. So you have six oxen and you need to, you know, bring them together two by two so that you can go into the field and plow. If any one of those feels that they are better than the other, you will not achieve anything in the field. If you have players, 11 players in the field, and they each decide, now I'm going to do my own goal. I'll score my own goal. You are not going to succeed. This is the nature of uh, human beings. We work by a collegiality, by cooperation, by um, recognizing the other person for their full worth, wealth, I mean worth, because we can never replicate the other person, ever. Um, as I'm welcoming you, I want you to remember certain words that we want to read of ourselves. Um, gossip backstabbing, up one rejection, unforgiveness, entitlement. These are things that I've experienced. I came here, I was a small girl in 1992. And in all this time, I have observed something that has shocked me, ha having cut my teeth in the university. Yes, of course. Um, in my time, we used to finish metric at 1516. This is the uh, calamity that befell me. So you can imagine having finished metric at 16 and being identified as one of the lecturers. <laughs> when you lecture, those boys were old, uh, Prajeri. They were 24 years old, and I just did not know what to do. And what I, what I got from there was that this is a profession of knowledge. This is a profession of respect. This is a profession of uh, um, working together. There is no way you can move without getting assistance and giving assistance. And if you feel angry, voice out your anger. Deal with your anger and continue with the work. But over time, I've realized that if uh, Mema Khanu applies for a position of director, and I also apply, I put in my application, and uh, seven other people, some from outside, put their application, and she gets it. She is my permanent enemy for life. I won't forgive her. She didn't interview herself. She applied. She compiled her CV, she presented herself, she drank so much water when they were asking her questions. We never forgive. I wish we could learn, Africa. I really wish we could learn 
to appreciate one another. Uh, no one is an angel, but if we could just learn to say, you know what, ah, you beat me, and I'm angry for four weeks, but I'm fine. After four weeks, we can proceed. If we do not, history is going to judge us very, very, very harshly because each one of us is writing our own CV. More than our own CV, each one of us is writing our book of history. I'm very excited with these sessions because culture change is not just about relationships. It is about those committees that we bring together, how we manage those committees, and how we perceive them to be a legacy and a dynasty for life. They are not. You manage it, you move on. Culture change is about those young uh, scholars who are coming in. It's about us mentoring them selflessly. It's about us being vulnerable and saying, you know what, I don't quite know this area, but I've got a friend in UJ. I think he knows this area. I'll link you up with that person. Culture change is about not um, holding on to your own and say, you know, we've always done it like this. For 34 years, we did it like this. No, change has come, colleagues. If we have to move this institution forward, we have to learn to unlearn so that we can relearn certain things. Uh, culture change is about being vulnerable about this expert knowledge that you have acquired in your field. It is expert. Uh, I, I often say that I respect scientists, but no one can beat an English professor like me, really. <laughs> Um, I say it uh, with a tongue-in-cheek because I know we fear English professors. We fear what they learned, what we never learned. But let me tell you something. It's about a society of English people from 4th century, Anglo-Saxon to 20th century. It's a society from which we can learn the good and the bad. As we bring forward our own societies, that are equally valid. Culture change is about being uh, able to share what you have without fearing that you're going to be made invisible. I was saying to other colleagues the other day, uh, Prajeri, I'm very worried. When I first came to UNISA, there were many young men who were speaking Africans, young girls, they were speaking Africans and Chinese, some were speaking Greek, and they are gone. They are gone from this university. And it worries me. It really does. My AP, where did they go? What chased them away? Colleagues, let, let us be serious. What is chasing these young people of other ethnic groups from our miss? What are we doing wrong? I should be worried. I'm a mother. I, I should be worried. I'm a teacher. I should be worried because I want to learn from all these diverse um, groups of people. Because now, if you start and, and, and say we are doing um, diversity, we are doing transformation, we are doing multiculturalism and multilingualism, they say, ah, it's apartheid in reverse, you want to destroy us. Who blames them? I don't. I, I want to, to, to learn, I was saying to my friend Velem, I won't tell you his surname. <coughs> I was saying to my friend, Willem, you know, I really wish I had paid attention when my father was trying to teach me Africans. Because right now, I only end with Huye <laughs> More. It, it's not right. It's not right. Because within that language, there is so much that is different from mine, that is so identical to mine. I can't believe it. Culture change is that we need to accept ourselves. We are stuck here. This is our place. This is our country. We are stuck here. We are not on sabbatical leave from Europe. We are stuck here. We better learn to appreciate one another, grow and teach, you know, the students. Give them that diverse, rich knowledge. No knowledge is secondary to the other. Forgiveness, cooperation, gossip, revenge, those will not take us anywhere. We cannot move forward. 
As I close, um, Sissy, when I came in, you, you, you spoke about me, right? <laughs> As I close, I, you know, we, we used to do um, physical marking of scripts, you know. I had huge piles in my office as a lecturer. So I thought, you know what, I also have this work at the d -Hat. I must run in, you know, to town and just get some of the forms they're preparing for the end of the year. Um, so I must go and fill those forms. So I rushed to town, I parked somewhere, and I went in, I saw Professor Dreyer there, and I filled the forms. When I came out, my car had been bashed in the parking. And I thought, sure, okay. So I, I didn't even want to ask because my Sisutu is, is, very, is very bad. <laughs> so I didn't even want to ask uh, what happened here because now I wouldn't know whether I'm speaking Sisutu or Sitsuana. <laughs> you know, just, you know. So as I come, this person says, Hey, Bafitlili, give me a tosa, give me a tosa. Atlili Mandela. Uh, in other words, you know what? They've come to Gauteng. These tossers, Mandela has brought them all here. We will fix them. I felt, wow, the stars are against me. I went into my car and I drove brrr, to UNISA. When I got to UNISA, I found that uh, some of the cafeterias had closed. So I had to rush to that one. It used to be called the admin building at the time. It was not uh, OR Tambo. When I went there, then I, I was asking, I, I just tried to polish up my best suit, you know, best. So I went to this uh, uh, lady who was serving. She just looked that way. <laughs> and then I asked, uh, Do you still, are you still serving um, some lunch? And then I heard her talking to the other one. What kind of a person is this one? And then the other one, oh, it's the Tosas. <laughs> <laughs> And, and believe you me, I'm not even closer, you know. I'm going, yes, I'm very comfortable. It's the closers. Hey, but, but train, yeah, man. You know, they, 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 you know, they think they own the world. And I thought, my God, what's wrong with me? And it dawned on me that it's actually not their fault. It's not even my fault. The fault, dear Brutus, <laughs> is on your stars. It was just that moment when the atmosphere was just not seeing Zodwa. I, I could not, uh, you know, hold it against anybody. And that's where I remembered my father says, if the atmosphere is against you, retreat before you meet danger. Go to your corner. So I quickly grabbed my lunch and I retreated. I did not say, what's working in no, 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 no. I just went to my corner and I sat there and I asked my God, is it safe to come out now? He said, no, sit, mark. I sat, I marked the scripts. It does happen. It's not about people. Sometimes we, we, we are social beings. We are spiritual beings. Believe it or not, we are. Sometimes there's just that crossing of the galaxies over you and you think, ah, Prof Mahan, yeah, I know she doesn't like me. Let's do it, colleagues. It's not nice to read about us, even things that you know are blatantly wrong in the media. And Rina, we royal people, we don't answer everything. We just ignore you and do the right thing. So let us just try and be royal people. Let's not offer answers. Let's do the right thing. Let's serve the students. Let's support our colleagues. Let's support the academic project. And uh, thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Moza Madigani, indeed. We must focus on the academic project. Um, colleagues, we have 15 minutes of question and answer. I'm going to call upon uh, if you can collect them so that we don't know this question comes from Dr. Makhatukuno and it's directed to Prof. Mahano. So uh, is she in? 
the house. If we can collect all the questions, we have 15 minutes. I hope we will be able to do it quickly. Uh, yes. Can we just bring them forth and the Menkate Komahora, our psychologist, to come forth? I, I feel we need to applaud her again, you know, for being so selfless. I, I like the, the metaphor of a cat dying and then I'm forced to come to work and I'm not functional. It, it was so practical and real. Uh, and in that, in that cat dying, me as the line manager, I'm forcing you to come to work, but delivery is not there. There's no productivity. And I don't understand because of my fixation, the mental model that it's, I fall. It's just a cat. It's, uh, it's just a cat. How can you cry? Ah, uh, cats. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what should we do. Should we read it for, uh, for you? and then you, you process and answer. Colleagues, I have a few questions. We have 15 minutes. Dr. Makhatu, can you time me? Um, she, she has enough air time. She can exceed and I have enough air time. Um, how do we promote and enhance the strategy to reflect and unpack our mental model? I think this one stood out, the mental model. How do we promote and enhance the mod, uh, strategy to reflect and unpack our mental model? Over to you, Me. Yeah, it's a very important one. And I think um, most of the time, it's, it, it, it needs to be a reflexive um, process. So when I say a reflexive process, um, it will be, okay, my mental model is that um, cats are used by witches. I'm just going to be random like that. My mental model is cats are used by witches, okay? I've got Nkateko, my colleague, who's got a cat and she's crying and um, about her cat. Okay, in my experience, is Nkateko a witch? Okay, that's not the case. All right, so how come am I still maintaining that cats are used by witches? Okay, so it's got to be a very reflexive um, uh, 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 process. Um, let me also point out maybe a stronger one. I think a... A stronger one might be that management does not listen, okay? So that is a very strong mental model, that me as a, senior, as a junior, management is not going to listen to me. All right, what have I, I ask myself, what have I tried before where management has not listened? Okay, I, ask, I answer myself, all right, I went to Professor Mahanu's office and then, then um, she, he, she told me that I should write an email. I wrote an email, but she did not respond. Therefore, management does not listen. Okay, let's check. The time that I sent the email, she was off or she did not, am I sure that she got the email or it went to spam? fact finding so in challenging our mental models there's got to be a lot of fact finding you can even tell yourself other mental models such as um, certain people are lazy okay or they don't think or they don't like to think or they are not intelligent how are you substantiating that mental model what is it that still maintains your stance is this factual or is this subjective? If it's factual, then you can maintain your mental model. But if it's subjective, then you need to challenge to say, where is it coming from and what is it, how is it affecting my behavior in interacting and engaging with this person? Because if you feel that um, juniors are not intelligent or they don't take initiative, it means you will always be doing work by yourself and you will not delegate because that is your mental model. So now you are going to be overworked and what is going to happen? You are going to resent your colleagues or 
your juniors. And then, then you are going to start to scheme and make sure that they move away, which is constructive dismissal. Now your actions, your behavior is coming from a mental model that we don't know, but you had believed that juniors are not intelligent or they're lazy, but then now you start to scheme in terms of constructively dismissing them. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The other one is in light of emotional intelligence, particularly in the context of an institution of higher learning, how do you deal with patriarchy and male dominance as well as power dynamics? Does psychology deal with issues such as patriarchy and misogyny? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, psychology is interested and deals with uh, issues of patriarchy, patriarchy and misogyny. Um, we have what we term toxic masculinity, and I think also, um, you know, there's a number of uh, works that I have done with my team in addressing that. Um, it, it, it is hard, I must say, it is difficult to enter any space that has got an ism in it. Ne? Any ism in it, uh, be it uh, feminism, racism, you know, uh, your, um, uh, the ma masculine, masculinity that is uh, toxic. So in you entering that space, I will say, what is the self-awareness that you are bringing? By the way, I have um, started to embark on a journey of being mentored because now I'm in business full time, uh, so I needed mentors in the business environment. And I told this mentee of mine, I said, you intimidate me. I said to them, because I am not used to people dealing in that cutthroat, cold way. But the intimidation was not because they are intimidating. It was because of my own mental model about the business world and how people should work and the cordiality, the courtesy, the niceness. So meaning that he basically is saying to me, I should stop being so nice. Because there's a certain way in which I have to start to deal with people. As we speak, I've got a legal letter that I'm drafting to one of my tenants right now, who is my colleague. And by the way, in my discomfort, I was very con uncomfortable. I would not have, if I was not embarking on this journey, I would not have been writing that because I would be like, ah, but then our relationship is going to be lost. Uh, how is she going to view me? Oh, I'm not being nice. So the intimidation was not because that space is intimidating. It was because of the internal processes. So I think to also the, um, the person who's questioning, uh, who's, who's asking, is how are you coming into the space yourself um, for you to be experiencing the oppression of the misogyny and the, um, you know, the patriarchy? Because if it is overt patriarchy, I think it can be challenged through structures. Uh, there are policies that will b back you up as your human rights. If it's subtle, I think you can um, um, address them from a human relations uh, point of view. So I will say maybe what is your relationship also with that toxicity, that toxic masculinity, and investigate that, and then, then from that uh, grow uh, an assertiveness and a self-confidence to challenge that. Mm -hmm. I came into a situation without any preconceived mental model, but a negative mental model developed afterwards. How do I fix it? Hmm. So you, you came uh, to, to Blarasa, that's ne, what we call it, uh, the, the clean, clean slate and maybe open-minded, and then as time went on, you had certain experiences that said, um, this is a, a negative space. Um, if it's structural issues, um, and, and if you have tried the structures as well, for example, your human resource, um, I will say then take them maybe a, a level up, especially if it's structural issues. So what I mean, structural issues will be uh, toxicity, 
um, the uh, unfairness, I, I think, you know, things that are a little bit tangible. But if it's things such as cliques, uh, for example, Mgozi, the gossip that Prof was talking about, uh, you know, um, uh, fractions. F I, I, I will say focus on your work and what you are also here for. Not everyone is supposed to be nice to you. So if it's, as I'm saying, if it's those kind of things, the fractions, cliques, Mgozi, uh, all of that. Um, sometimes we want to belong to spaces that do not accept us, and I think it's also fine. Make it okay for you not to belong there and focus on what you need to do as long as your productivity is not impacted uh, negatively. But if it's structural, um, um, uh, do involve your human resource. If human resource has not taken it up, uh, go a level a little bit up. Thank you. Actually, you have answered the question mm. on clicks. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 yeah. the question on clicks. Yeah, you, you, you can't one. do anything about clicks. Eh? Clicks, uh -huh. clicks are clicks. If you come in, um, in Sipedi, we say, uh, so sometimes take it as, you know what, then it means I will not be um, invited to birthday parties and baby showers, then it means less petrol for me and less present. <laughs> really, like, uh, it's so much less effort, eh? Yeah, so much less effort. Uh, less, less me doing my hair on a Saturday when I just want to be in my pyjamas. Eh? You know, so just uh, something like that. Uh, be emotionally intelligent to yourself as well. Yeah. Okay. Hey, the timekeeper is so strict. It's five minutes. But I'm going to read, I think, four that are related. How does communication relate, fit with my EQ, personality, and education? How do you balance EQ and IQ? And... Um, how is EQ related to SQ, social and cultural, especially when it relates to perceptions brought by your mental model? Mm -hmm. So it's EQ, mm. IQ, mm. social. Yeah, social. Uh, yes. uh, okay. um, I, I think they are all related. And you remember I made a case earlier on in a um, slide where there are studies that have showed that e IQ is um, accountable, can be accounted for one, between one to 20% of success, where EQ between 16 and 40% of success. So it's not to say one is better than the other, but a, having a combination. So if there's only IQ that is um, present and there's no EQ, the, the, the rate of success can really, they, they, there's a limitation. So meaning that the person can apply themselves skillfully, but then in terms of growing in their influence, their sphere of influence, a space, um, um, and a general well-being and happiness, um, it will be limited. Um, the same with uh, social IQ as well. It's also related to EQ and what is the other one? I know the, it's the four of them. It's social IQ. Yeah. Personality. Okay, the personality. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so IQ is usually, I will say, plus minus fixed. When I say fixed, is that that is why we do aptitude tests. Aptitude tests, they determine to us to say, okay, this person has got a potential. It's not a limitation. It's a potential of, uh, we will make a recommendation in a report of studying at a, uni a, 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 a institution of a higher learning or a technical uh, college or a, a, a university. So this is the potential the person has. So this is IQ, more or less innate, inborn. Personality, you have the different, the, the, the um, ability with EQ to adapt your personality depending on a situation. And I gave an example with being introverted, but right now I am extroverting. Or you can say, I am a loud person. You know, I am flamboyant, I am loud, I am vivacious, but then we cannot be vivacious in a funeral. So do you see now, 
EQ helps to balance what is an innate born personality for you to adjust it. And remember, we talked about that component of, uh, of flexibility. So then that's how you balance it out. Thank you. I think some will be answered by uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because, uh, no, 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 I have this one. It's key, key, okay. key to you. Mm -hmm. Please don't leave. Um, because they are more like life issues and identity and they're uh, being rejected from one's upbringing. I think that's your stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that one you are going to kill it. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> for male psychologist, how can we advise uh, and encourage managers to trust the decision making of subordinates to make correct decisions? The other one related to it, my emotional signs and internal at the moment. I'm worried, frustrated, scared, worried about my future at UNISA, that I'm not being listened to, mm -hmm. that I may retire before my actual time because I do not feel mm -hmm. I've been taken seriously. I think these are friends yeah. is in line with them. Yeah. Okay. So I think those, are, and then others colleagues, we are going to tie them with the, the uh, a, a, a address from Dr. Jeremy Fukin, because it's more like, who are you? Where do you come from? How do you come into the space and actualize yourself? Mm -hmm. It's more on who are you? What mm -hmm. is Benek and mm -hmm. Yeah, Be because the internal locus of control mm -hmm. determines your path throughout life. Mm -hmm. Over to you. Okay. So the first one, how can I advise, uh, ad advise to encourage managers to trust the decision making of subordinates to make correct decision? And I think in this one, I would like to highlight that example that I made of an interim SAA CEO on decision making. Um, let's go to the first quadrant um, where I am talking about, uh, where is that? Yes, the, in the work. So problem, problem solving. In the workplace, the method used problem solving is critical, viable, alternative solution must be considered, including a cost benefit analysis and long term implication. I believe for any reasonable manager, unless if your manager is not reasonable and you have diagnosed them as such, uh, depending on your mental model, but for any reasonable manager, if you bring a cost effective strategy or suggestion that is uh, applicable and that will also have the benefit for them as a unit, I, I don't see why will a manager want to reject it, especially as I said, if you demonstrate, okay, this is the reason why I say this decision is better for us than this one. So meaning that you will need to, need to practice the assertiveness that I talked about. So if it was rejected once, twice, three times, but you see that mm -mm, this makes more sense than the other decision that they are trying to make. Let me go back and show them the numbers and show them what do we um, gain, what do we lose uh, 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 different from the one that they have suggested? Back it up with facts and research, not uh, just uh, something of a hearsay. Um, and as I said, a reasonable manager will take that. And then this one, my emotion signs internal at the moment, worried about my future at UNISA, frustrated that I'm not being listened to, scared that I'm, I may retire before my actual time because I do not feel I'm being taken seriously. So it means you are experiencing all kinds of negative emotions about your employment. Um, one of the places I will say, and I know you do have EAP, um, here at UNISA and counseling, I will say go talk it with an independent person from where you are. Just go talk it through to say what does it mean, what does that decision of you taking an early retirement mean uh, so that it's not an impulsive decision. Um, you are not just acting out of impulse, but you are being rational, you are looking at your uh, life alternatives as well. Maybe you might find that you, you think you are stuck here, but only to find that you do also have alternatives or also given perspective that you look at your employer differently. You remember the case study that I have mentioned, that the person is very unhappy, not fulfilled, not feeling that they are aligned and in their purpose, but 
with gaining perspective, now they can see that they are able to keep their house because of the employment. And not to say that I'm encouraging toxic employment um, environments, but to say we need to also uh, take a step back and have a look. I mean, um, I was tempted, I think it was somewhere late last year, where things were a little bit hot, uh, as you can imagine, as an entrepreneur and a business owner, and I was tempted to be applying, and I think I did even uh, approach a, a person or two about the reference. And then, then when I look at perspective, I was like, ah, Eman, uh, Okare, uh, life of employment is not for me anymore because this is what I enjoy, this is what I enjoy, this is what I enjoy, this is what I enjoy. And I was like, okay, no, chill. You were just feeling the heat. You were, you were hot. Now we are cool. Uh, let's chill now. Okay, so perspective can also help a lot. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Colleagues, we, we, we are waiting for lunch, but it seems lunch is not here. I am suggesting that while um, Me Mwahi, are you saying something? Oh, lunch is next door. We are going to take 30 minutes, exactly 30, and please don't go away. Colleagues, we are trying to help ourselves and not helping ourselves as UNISA staff, but helping ourselves as people. Life is good, and I want to live up to age uh, plus 90 and 100, B because life is good, you know? <laughs> and, and when life is good, is when things are good to you. But we are going to see thorns, lions will be on the road, and then dogs will be barking at you. And when the gate is closed, don't, don't stop and throw the dogs, you know, with stones. The gate is closed. Pass, walk. Why do you stop? They will keep on barking because maybe you are dressed beautifully and they've never seen somebody like you. And then, so why should you stop? You just say, oh, they admire my beauty. And then you pass. So let's go and have lunch for 30 minutes and come back and enjoy. Thank you.
unhappy about is that there were free consultations uh, to our psychologists. I don't know, did they bring medical aid? <laughs> okay, no. And then some also want to see you. So before you leave, um, I think uh, those who want to see you, you will make sure that you give them your contact uh, and then we start. We are building one another. Um, as iron sharpens iron, yeah. So we need that. Sometimes we need those moments of reflecting, not talking pedagogy, but talking the pedagogy of life. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to call Dr. Henry Mungela to come and introduce our second keynote speaker by reading the biography. Uh, shall we applaud Tate Munyela? Yes, it is. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Afternoon. I hope you were energized after that wonderful meal. Uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Jerry Mufukeng, our next speaker, a legend in film and TV, an ambassador in his sector. He has represented the country across continents. His impact goes beyond uh, the artistic representations. He has produced artists and academics through his work and uh, also an academic at uh, his alma mater, uh, Vets University. Uh, his heart for development has left an impact and a legacy everywhere he has served in management and leadership. In his tenures as a council board member, he always brings reason and integrity to all deliberations. The council always counts on him for integrity, and I guess uh, that's very critical a value at this time. Uh, he brings about discipline, he brings about harmony between board members, council members, and I, yeah, we can do a lot with that at the moment, harmony, uh, discipline, uh, especially working from different parts of the province or the country, and in fact, uh, the world. Uh, now some of us are working across the oceans. Uh, he enjoys the respect across the artistic, the academic, and the council environments wherever he, uh, he serves. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Mufugeng for the next two hours. I accept the pressure. Jumela. <laughs> Lekai. Sure. Thank you. That, that, thank you to the presentation that we got this morning. I am educated. I am educated. There's something that I'm going to be talking about as we go along, something called reflection. You get angry and you stop and you say, why am I angry? No, 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 let's forget about this person. Let's put them on pause for a second. Why am I angry? Because the fault might just be with me. And if it is with me, let me do me before I do the other person. So the notes I saw here, I, I sure. Yeah, I was being workshopped. Thank you very much. Uh, I said to Prof, I, I, I like the sincerity that comes from, for, from speaking off script. Did you realize how hot she got when she put her phone aside? I don't know, I'm a director, I watch how people behave and how they carry themselves. And, and when she talked about royalty, 
I hope you got that note so that I don't keep repeating what people have said. Why, what she talked about royalty. Uh, let me put it in a very hard way. If two people are arguing and insulting each other in a room and you enter the room, The challenge for you is to decide who is a fool and who is normal in that room. <laughs> Royalty do not argue or fight like fools. Yes. I, that's, that's what I got from what she was saying. Royalty know how to keep quiet and not waste time with nonsense if I can put it that way. I, I, I'm an actor, I'm allowed, I have the freedom. It's not, it's not a lecture, it's not a UNISA lecture. There, there is a <laughs> disclaimer. All opinions expressed here do not come from management. <laughs> <laughs> Prof. Mukhano, thank you th so much for giving me this platform. I got scared, and I got nervous, and I got excited, and I just thought I'm going to be me. So ladies and gentlemen, please understand for the rest of this session, it will not be a lecture. We're going to be talking, we're going to be doing, we're going to be playing, we're going to be, I, 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 I got my degree in, in acting, and then I got my master's in directing, and then I added theater in education. And so sometimes I'll be asking you to do things that will sound frivolous, but at the end you say, oh, right. And I'm going to give you the first assignment. Knowing me, knowing you. I'm going to give you two minutes. Huh? What happened? I call. You got me nicely connected, bro. What, why, why did it disappear? <laughs> See, I'm, I'm technology. Technology karma mm -hmm. was tape, woman. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask, give you two minutes. We have the rest of the room. I'd like you to find somebody that's different from you in three different ways. I'm going to give you five categories. You're going to find three out of the five because it might be difficult to find somebody that has five out of five. All right. Three out of five. And... All right. One, their home language is different from yours. <laughs> Even the black languages or the white languages, their different language is different from yours. Two, there's an age difference of 12 years minimum. <laughs> Three. Three, they come from a different section, different department, different, it's different units here. Yeah? It's different units. Again, okay, they must be from a different unit. Four, they started working here three years apart from the time you started. And lastly, if possible, different gender. Can I repeat those? Either different home language, different age difference by 12 years, different depart unit, different started working here three years apart from you, and different gender. You've got two minutes starting now. All right, you must go stand up. Hey, you can't observe them. 
hold them by the hand. Two minutes. Some people are sitting down and I don't know how they're going to find those people. I don't want to embarrass people because I'll come to you. I don't know. I give up. Everybody found someone? And there's two people everywhere, not three. Please stay with your friend. Please stay with your newfound friend. Are you, are you together? OK. Here is what you must do. First, Teach each other an idiom or a saying that is unique to your language. An idiom or a saying that is unique to your language. You must teach them how to say it. Teach them something that is unique in your language. Guys, I'm going to be pointing at people and don't say I don't like you when I point you. Are you done with that one? Teach them something that they, before today, they would not have known. Number two, hello? Number two, tell your partner the one thing that is not general knowledge about you. Last time I was with somebody in a conference, somebody said they were declared dead and they were put aside until their medical doctor called her, her mom. And I, like two and a half hours later, they, were, they found out that she actually was alive. Okay? Now that's something special. 
What is it that's special, that's unique, that's not general knowledge about you? Tell your partner. Okay. Okay. I call. You should be able to remember those things that your partner taught you. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, okay. <laughs> ah, some people are not taking instructions. There are people, there are people, there are people, hello, at the corner there, there are people, there are people who get you very angry with what they do or don't do, with what they say or don't say. You just can't stand it. You, you just, no names. Who are those kinds of people? They, they just, they just, you, you just, no matter how hard you try, go. No names, please. Who gets the worst out of you? I'll give you one extra minute. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi. I'm not the kind of person that gets you angry. Please, let's have silence. <laughs> um, I'm not that kind of person. Eh? Okay. You've met this person for the first time possibly today. Please ask, ask them the one thing that you're curious about that you'd like to know. 
nothing personal, and they have under the Popia Act, you know, uh, you must be careful. So, what one thing would you really like to know about this person? One thing, ask. You can go back to your seats. You can go back to your seats. You can go back to your seats. Thank you. Are you back to your seat? Our oh, people are having fun. And we had silence when people got back to their seats. Thank you. Are you back to your seats? Um, my name is Jerry Mufuking Wamahed, and that name did not come from artists becoming fashionable. It was at age 58 when I found out who my father was, 58, which said that for 59 years, my existence was a secret. And that is the scar that I brought to my life. And because that is the scar that I brought with myself in my life, I, I wrote this book, I'm a Man. I wrote this book, I'm a man, and uh, let me read you the introduction to the last chapter. I'm a man, I have lived, I have died, I have loved, I have hated, I've been celebrated, I've been shamed, I've been honored as a man, I've been emasculated, and still I live. I know I'm a man, I know who I'm not, I know who I am, I know what I am, I know what I'm not, I'm a man. And then the last paragraph in the book. In these pages I've sought to lay out parts of my journey you might find instructive. Faith has seen me through it all. It wasn't easy, but it was all worth it. It was difficult, but it was possible. It remains possible. 
I'm not a perfect man, but maybe it's those imperfections that make me humanly perfect. I'm not an angel. After all, I'm a man. And, and so I talk a lot about the question of identity. Identity in the sense that um, I talk a lot to men, but I'd like to apply it to both sexes. Your birth certificate does not make you a man or a woman by definition. It tells us the gender. It tells us you're male or female. It also tells us how old you are. But you have 50-year-old boys and girls. 50-year boys and girls. May Ma say yes. We have those in our homes. The number of children does not necessarily make you a man or a woman. Because how many men father their children? How many women mother their children? Just about anybody who has been gifted by God to be able to reproduce has got a child. In my field of work, when, when legends die, when stars die, at their funerals, you find 27 children, 15 different mothers. You haven't seen that. That's what it is. There are so many external things that are a facade of what a real man, woman is. The outside things do not tell us who you are. They're just a facade. Manhood, womanhood is an inside job. Everything you do outside reflects who and what you are inside. And so, the workplace is not a crash, it's not babysitting, it's for men and women. And I think we expect nothing less of others, and therefore we should accept nothing less of ourselves. We should accept when we say we want to be reasonable, not common sense, reasonable, in every possible way, we expect to be dealing with men and women in the workplace. Um, when I talk in line with my book, I say to, to the gentleman, it's not fair. Every child, every child wants to be fathered. Every child. Some of us in here at age 55, we're still crying to be fathered. So we grow up scarred with daddy issues. Daddy issues. Especially boys. You always want to get the approval of your father. If daddy says it's all right, it's all right. And so many of us have grown up with daddy issues. The problem is that the issues have gone to the next generation to ourselves. How many illegitimate children have illegitimate children? How many men that know no father in their own lives do not father their children? No, I'm sorry, it's not enough to support. You are outsourcing fathering. You need to father. You need to father. 
Gentlemen, the women get married for companionship. They want you before your things. And, 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 and people come, Daddy Jerry, you're 42 years married, 42. Hey man, what's the secret? Give the woman, be there. Two words, be there. For the wife and for the children, be there. That's it. And, and, and then you have a serious problem when women try to be equal to men. Please be equal to yourself, not to a man. Do not fight a man like a man because you're not going to win. You can win the fight, but you've lost the relationship. You've lost the department. You've lost the unit. You've lost the institution. And, and so... I address these things because you talk about emotional intelligence. Um, please, please allow me to, from time to time, to refer to, to the Bible. And, and I'm going ahead of myself. I'm going ahead of myself. I'm going to go to it because I learned a lot this morning. There's a verse in the Bible, Proverbs 19, 11. Man can be, woman can be anybody. An employee, a UNISA employee's discretion. Discretion, the ability to make smart choices in an abnormal situation. Their discretion makes them slow to anger. Please, please hear me out. There are times when anger is needed. In appropriate times, appropriate environments. Because you cannot change what you tolerate. You cannot change what you tolerate. There are those things that cannot and should not be tolerated. And so we do need to be angry, but anger should not be an excuse for the things that we did or said. I, Dr. Jerry, I, Prof, I was angry. You're angry, so what? You're angry, so what? You're not a baby here. You're not gonna say and do things. Even those who get drunk, if they got Madeba in front of them, they'd sober up and not do or say those things. And so if you love or respect anybody, there are things you will not say, you will not do. Anger is no excuse. It's no excuse. And so, the Unisayans discretion makes them slow to anger. It is to, it is to their glory to overlook a transgression. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me out. There are times you accept an apology that will never come. That is emotional intelligence. You accept an apology that will never come. Because Mama was talking about clicks. Clicks, yeah? They have a blind spot. They have a blind spot. They think we need each other to survive in this place. And, and, and they do things and they say things or don't do things or don't say things. They, they, they make your projects to fail. They submit late. They submit inferior work. They, they do all those things. And, and, and you see, it's easy for all of us when we talk to our kids and we tell them, you know, you, I ask you to wash your dishes and to make up your bed. You think you're cheating me, you're cheating yourself. 
because he's teaching your conscience and your mind and your hands that you're not a dishwashing person. And one day you are in your own estate and you outsource yourself to the maid. A helper is there for those times when you cannot, do not have the time, not when you do not have the hands to do what you need to do. Now, it's easy to say those things about the children. What about ourselves? In, in a marriage setup, in a marriage setup, we do not want our mothers and grandmothers and sisters to say, oh, Sam is such a problem. Maybe if he got married, he'd get better. <laughs> what we are saying is that Sam is such a problem, let's outsource him to that 32-year-old. <laughs> Now, there are some people who have excellent technical skills and they come from the best of homes, but they are children in themselves. And we outsource them to UNISA. And they are a problem everywhere. You can't advise them. You can't correct them. You can't lead them. At that point, let me, let me talk to, to, to the ladies in here and say, we, it's, it's very easy, it's very cheap to insult men. It's very easy, it's very cheap. <sighs> you know, many, one, 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 I, I was at a wedding and this lady is with her daughter, and the daughter says, the teacher, all my life, my mother taught me that men are dogs. Now that I'm 31, she's intimating, Tantijuali baby, what's wrong? How come I don't see anybody in your social status or anything, or do you need help? Women end up hating festive season because the rest of the family will say, and two? <laughs> Can't you what's wrong? And so she says, so I'm asking my mother, which dog must I get married to? <laughs> now, I'm saying this to address patriarchy in a different way. Listen to music that comes from our societies. And they tell the lady when she gets married, don't ask a man where he comes from. Don't ask a man where he comes from. The primary medication for the girl who gets married is nyamezela. Endure. You endure when you go to prison because otherwise you're going to get it. The, the situation and the personnel don't care who you are. You told the line. Now, if you tell Makoti to endure, it means they are going into an environment and personnel that is not meant for them. They're not going to be sweet at it. The men, by simply on the basis of their gender, they are disabled. You are disabled simply because they're based on gender. And, and, and we don't volunteer ourselves into a position of discomfort. A situation where I, I, I'm taking a little detour, Prof, and, and I'll come back. I'll come back to the notes. Uh, people don't need notes. We need to get it right here at UNISA. Let's get it right. Uh, uh, a, a, a lady hears that her husband has been cheating 
and, and so she pretends to go to work and comes back and catches them right-handed, and, and then she fights, and the man takes Makwapeni out and then comes back, locks the doors, and donors say, pink and blue. And then, you know, when they say, it's a family matter. Huh? It's a family matter. And, 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 and then the, 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 the women say to the lady, What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Huh? He married you. Marriage is a status and a favor from men. He married you. Two, he built you a big house. You got a big car and, 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 and you live in an estate. What's wrong with you? Leave him alone. He's a man. What does he's a man mean? It means there is no self-control. There's no discipline. There's no accountability. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no. It's just like those people, everybody knows that this person every time on a Monday or a day after a holiday or after festive season, they are ineffective. Everybody knows that. Leave them alone. We say, because they are disabled. And then the, the old man goes to his son-in-law and says, listen, man, we all do it. Just cover your tracks. That is in a family setting. What about those fathers-in-law at UNISA? Bruh. Just, just, I'll give you a template. Just do it. You'll get away with it. We teach each other to a level of incompetence. And we feel good about it. You're good about it. As I was on this toxic masculinity. Ladies, we teach our sons to hate their fathers. And we teach them to hate masculinity. And we have problems with them when they go out there and cannot take leadership, and they have no respect. No respect. Too many young men I have counseled, they have said, I've always been surrounded by women. Yeah, no problem with that. But it's not enough to grow up to be a big boy. We need men in this world. And when I say men, I talk about people who take responsibility and accountability and leadership when necessary. That's what we need. It's about maturity. Maturity. I, I'm going to come to you for mentorship. I need psychological ways of explaining this. We don't want children. We want maturity. You know, what, you, you remember that chapter about love in 1 Corinthians 13? When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I spoke like a child. I've you too. Blah, 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 blah. That's how children speak, right? And, and here at work, we don't want children. Ne? Huh? Aye, aye, aye. We don't want fuck fuck here at work. We're, but when I became mature, I, I, Put those things behind me. Now, nobody, nobody can teach you how to, to put those things behind you unless perhaps you go to the psychologist and say, look, I have an anger problem. I have a prejudice problem. I need assistance to package myself and so that I am not a problem to myself before other people. 
And then we have young men who grow up angry. And when they are angry, they take out the anger on those who are vulnerable and weaker than themselves. And so we get bullies at work. Bullies. There's nothing special about your anger. Don't ask us to glorify your anger. There's nothing special about your anger. Ask if I'm speaking like a 66-year-old 66 opa. It's nothing special. You know, you know, me, when I get angry. Fine, fine, get angry. Tell us when you're done. <laughs> Tell us when you're done. We're here to work. This, 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 this place is not about temper tantrums. We are here to work. I said, I wasn't sent by management to say this. I, you can see I'm off script at this point. And, and I want us to do a little exercise. Little exercise because it's, it's an actor's exercise, but it works for everybody. Everything we do as actors and dancers, and it's all about breath. It's all about breath. It's about breath. And I was wishing when the slides were going here, I kept saying, I hope they got that. I hope they got that. Anger is physiological. Anger is what? You know. You can pick up the signs when you get angry. You know. In my family, as soon as you see somebody with their nose, you know they are angry. It doesn't matter what they say. You just say, what's wrong? No, 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 no. What? No, no. What's wrong? No, 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 I guess, I guess you're right. I guess you're... So, can I ask you to sit as comfortably as you can on your chair with your back on the back of the chair? And put your hands facing up on the desk in front of you. And... I'd like you to sort of feel the breath going from your nose, dropping down via the chest into your stomach, and then coming out, and then the next load comes in and out. Don't push it. Don't slow it down. Let it go at its own pace. Just try that and go. Okay. Now here's what I'm going to ask us to do. We're going to take breath in for a count of four. Hold it in for a count of four. Take it out for a count of four. Relax. Take it. Repeat that three more times. So, yes, stand by and take it in. Four, three, two, one. Hold it in. Four. Three, two, one. Take it out. Four, three, two, one. Now, as you do that, please don't tense. Don't. Uh, uh. <laughs> it's got to flow by itself, yeah? And try it again. And in. Four, three, 
two, one. Hold it in, four, three, two, one. Out, four, three, two, one. Repeat, in four, three, two, one. Hold it, three, two, one. Out, three, two, one. And then breathe normally. How do you feel? Relaxed? Peace? Can you feel anything? Yeah? You feeling good? Let's let's do the lecture stuff. I skipped a few things. There's a hymn in Sesotho that says, Mele pelo le moya boto kaufel. Mele pelo le moya boto kaufel. Body, heart, spirit. Body, emotions, physical, psychological. Good health is good health when all aspects of our being are able to maintain equilibrium. Nothing is more than the other. They all talking to each other. There's harmony. When you listen to a jazz band singing, let's take an orchestra. When they sing the beautiful songs like the Hallelujah Chorus, you can't point and say, oh, that one is singing, that it all comes out as one. One. Harmony. Emotions are controlled. The physical health can be regulated. And we are able to protect, project ourselves physiologically. You've probably consulted, I, I like the example that um, our, our colleague gave here. You go and you say, I'm, I'm not well, you go to a doctor. And the doctor pretends they're still preliminary, they're not consulting yet. And they ask you a few questions and after answering those questions, and then they help you, and then you say, yeah, yeah, but doctor, where are the tablets? And the doctor realizes, oh, you only think your healing comes from tablets. They give you what are called placebos. Placebos are tablets that have got nothing in them. You're basically swallowing chalk. <laughs> A week later, you come back and you say, yo, 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 doctor, they worked. Those tablets worked. Your mind worked, not with the tablets. What point am I getting at? Bahis. The absence, the, the ailment that we presently facing can be in any of those departments, the body, the spirit, the mind. And, and please note that the loss can be immediate. Immediate. Something, you can hear something and immediately you lose it. Lose it if it's traumatic, you can even drop down because you heard or you saw something. Drop down. Not a heart attack, not COVID, no. You heard, you saw, some stimulus came your way. And, and the pain can register in other elements of your being. 
Um, so sometimes, sometimes things start in, allow me to say, in your feelings. You, you, you get a notice that says the, the sheriff has just sub brought a note that says you're divorced. Divorced. It goes to your mind, you register it, and then you get a heart attack. Or it can, it can start from any side of you, but immediately the loss of equilibrium goes throughout. And you've lost your health. Now, I'm going to use this time to just help us through anger management. I apologize, I, I had planned not to show you these notes, so I just wrote it all in capital letters and, uh, because it was for me. I was pre preparing until last night. Um, anger is physiological. The trigger works like a switch and it depends what plug you've switched on. If we tap into ourselves, we'll know when we're getting angry. We will know. And anger responds to the five senses. You could see something and you're gone. Ha. You see something from, I don't know which building, adverts it was like, uh, What's, what's the main building there? Uh, Senate Hall. You see somebody from Senate Hall, you just think, oh, we bad. We've had it. We've had it. It could be hearing. Imagine there is a graduation uh, ball that is being put together, and you're looking and you hear something, and you ask, excuse me, did Prof. so and so just, is that the person behind me? I don't want to look. You heard something, that voice has spoiled the entire evening for yourself. The touch. GBV, the touch. I, I know of environments where women have been asked to go to the sheets to get promotion. And then that person touches you again to say, yeah, let me not say it. And you feel so dirty. Just, just a brush touching you, passing. And it's like, you know what we've been through. The smell. Do you know that there are women who cannot stand a certain cologne because the rapist was wearing that cologne? If somebody went into a lift wearing that cologne, they'd freak out. Smell. Taste. Before long, those around you know which button never to press. I asked you to talk to each other about those. I'm not going to ask you. Mama taught me well earlier. They warn others, hey, don't go, don't, don't go there. Don't say that. Don't, don't go there. We generally feel justified, and so we do not keep ourselves in check. And so here are four steps that will help us to act like mature people and not spoiled children. I, I quoted this verse earlier. When I was a child, I spoke, I thought, I reasoned. But as an adult worker, 
in this institution. I gave up childish ways. I gave up childish ways. I hope, I hope the childish ways of boys who want their colleagues not to tell their wives that they are cheating here at work. Ask is, I, you know what I'm saying? I, I hope what I'm saying belongs to other companies, not here. Childish ways. Sheets for marks. Childish ways. Step one is control. When you are angry, you know what usually happens. You know. Try the exercise that we did earlier. What's that about? Basutu used to say to the, the daughters-in-law, you must put cold water under your tongue. It will calm down the other person. All they were saying is, don't argue with a fool. If two people, are, you know, you know a situation where there are two people, verbally you can write the text, there are two mouths really going at fast speed, but there are no ears. There are two mouths, no ears. You know when the Bible says, uh, be slow to speak, slow to anger, but quick to listen. When you listen, you hear. You hear. It's not noise. When people have argued and insulted each other, it's everybody else that heard what was said. If you ask the person who was in that situation, by the way, what did the other person say? No, no, no. They, they don't respect. Yeah, yeah. My coach was telling me, uh, ma'am, my coach was telling me, you know, we have basic needs. We have basic needs. And when those basic needs are violated, that is the issue. It's not the text. It's not the environment. It's, it's, it's when you feel like, oh, I greeted that person and they did not respond. You feel those people are not acknowledging me and they, they, they're making me feel like I don't belong here. And that's the issue. That's the issue. Yeah, Krujo. Krujo. How do you, how you, how you look at me? Huh? You take me skier, what can I? Boom! Control. Count up to ten is the old way of saying it. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. You, you know you're already on your way to being angry, but you, you halt yourself. You halt yourself. That is what maturity and emotional intelligence is about. You don't ask other people to halt you. You halt yourself. Step two, analysis, reflection. Why am I angry? Why am I angry? The slides were here earlier. Why am I angry? What is it about me that makes me angry about this? Now, because I, I work a lot in the marriage and relationships area, uh, let me make an example there. Um, a lady says to a man, um, you know, your mother, hey, 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 lost my old age. Hey, lost my old age. No, what, I, yeah, man. Didn't you hear what I said? Leave my mother alone. No, but Jerry, fro, gone. 
emotional intelligence, you'll go and read your notes. Three weeks later, the lady says, I think every 60-year-old, especially black women, should get into a plane at least once in their lives and go to a place like Cape Town, you know? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's a my idea. So can we do that for mama? Yeah, no, 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 no. And, 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 and because we do not want to take that time to reflect, we can't even apologize. You know, you know, there are those times when you've had an egg on your face, you were wrong, and you had insulted, and you had scannered, and you had gotten somebody into a disciplinary hearing, and you were wrong. And now, you're afraid to apologize. Analysis, why am I angry? In, 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 in relationships, romantic relationships, we often say to people, don't punish your present partner for the sins of your exes. Your partner was not there when your pa other partners cheated on you and abused you and lied to you. Now, this person is trying to make things worse, but, to work but you don't give them a chance because when they try something, because your ex used to do that, because your past boss, because your past competitor in another department, because of your ex, your ex, your ex, that you want to penalize this person in front of you and you do not want to give them a hearing and you're angry at your own prejudice and not what this person is saying or doing. And reflection is about that thing to say, no, I hear what this person is saying and what they're doing, but why am I getting angry? Am I making sense, ladies and gentlemen? We adult up. Use those notes that we got earlier. You adult up. I wrote here the man who was meditating on a boat. Imagine uh, early evening, the moon is out and this person is meditating and then poof, another boat hits them and they're just about to say, what the f And they realize the in, there's no one in the boat. There's no one in the boat. Are you angry at the boat or at the person? You know in your own department, in your own unit, what is the boat, what is the person? What and who are you angry with? That's what reflection is about. Step three, look. How important is this relationship? If your car has been in an accident or your son, daughter disappeared with your car or whatever and, and you had to take a taxi, uh, even an Uber, and, and this person just does something and, and you really get hot under the collar, is it material or immaterial? Should you be wasting your time with a fight about this or not? And if this relationship is long-term and it's important, then maybe we shouldn't fight like strutmates. Maybe we should take another look. Proverbs 24, 26, 4. Don't answer the foolish arguments of fools or you will become as foolish as they are. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to 
subscribe to the Bible for this principle to work. I'm just borrowing from the Bible what I believe works without necessarily saying the Bible has got it all for you. Step four, manage. Hopefully by this time, you know what it is that made you angry. You know what, whatever, uh, uh, whatever stimulus there was that made you feel the way you feel. At least you've stopped and you've analyzed. But what's also important is timing. You don't go out like a bullet. Please try this. I've tried it with, with a lot of people who've come in for counseling. When you're right, when you're justified, when you're angry, do not do or say anything that you might have to apologize for. When you're right, when you're justified, when you're angry, do not do or say anything that you might have to apologize for. Because by then, we're no longer focusing on what needed to be attended to. We are now talking about your insults and the doors that you banged and everything that you did. And you going out to go and sleep out and sleep with somebody else as a consolation. We're no longer dealing with the issue that we should have addressed as adults. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this, 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 platform is not about ticking the box. I, I hope that when you go back to your desks, because we live on Zooms in our own dining rooms and lounges, when you go back to your desk, we will begin to have colleagues with a certain level of emotional intelligence who can take responsibility and accountability and self-management in all that we do, say, feel, think, and so on. That would really be great. And I want to leave that one at that. Thank you. Uh, we'll do a quick Q&A later. How much time do I still have? Uh, clock, who's doing time? I know with Q&A we're supposed to end at 2.30, but how much time do I have now? How much time so am I supposed to finish? She wants to add. <laughs> Prof. Mahano wants to add. I think we can continue, and then Q&A was supposed to start 30.45 up to 14.30. So maybe we can reduce Q&A, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Continue up to 2 o'clock. <laughs> 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 Are we still together, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. We are. Yes. Are you getting helped? Are you? I came here with Tato, and I'm going to ask her to read something. 
as she reads it, I'd like you to work out who are the elephants, who are the scorpions, how can we help the elephants, how can we help the scorpions, what am I, don't talk about other people, what am I learning out of that? Even if that's, I think that's the only question I'll ask after this. What are you picking up from this story that Tato is going to read? Enjoy it. Good day, everyone. <laughs> My name is Tato, as uh, Papa have said. Um, and I'll be reading a very short story for you guys. Um, way up there in the Drakensberg Mountains, there lived a huge elephant and a little fat scorpion. They lived happily in their village. It was summer, the rivers were full, and the plants were the best colors of green, yellow, brown, and so on. So every morning, the elephant and the scorpion walked across a low bridge that allowed the elephant, that allowed the, the animals, sorry, the people and the cars to cross from one village to the other. So these two had their own differences. However, they lived happily together. One bright summer day, rains fell way up in the Maluti Mountains of Lesotho that joins the Drakensberg Mountains. The rivers got full within no time. Water went into the fields and the roads near the rivers. Soon the waters went roaring down the streams. The elephant and the scorpion stopped as they heard the scary sound coming from the upper side of the rivers. And they knew that that meant trouble. Before long, the white waters appeared and a flash flood hit their area. Trees fell, rocks rolled down the river. It was all very, very scary. However, the elephant had an advantage. You see, it was so big and so heavy the water could not drown it or sweep it off its feet, its feet. But the scorpion had a problem because it was small and it was very light right next to the, to the, to the raging rivers. The elephant started walking towards the river. It put its front legs in the water. The scorpion went begging for a lift home. Eh, eh, brother elephant, um, please, man, give me a ride home. You know, it's not far, but I can't jump or fly. Please, man, be nice. <laughs> man, wena, <laughs> I can give a lift to anybody else, but it's same way. be like that, man. We all make mistakes, you know. You know what they say, Mos, to err is human and to forgive is divine. You mean you can't forgive me for my little mistakes? Don't be like that. Scorpion, you know very well what your problem is. You cannot be trusted. Never. Never? Never? No, 
I have changed. Ha! Baka change aka ufele. Isingwena. Elephant, please, man. Wena utra blafa baba sa Now let me tell you about you. Wena you are just like any other scorpions. How na tanki man? You hurt the very same people that love and care for you. How to a highly scorpion. Wena, you can never, ever keep your promises. Utauka every time. It's the last time. There is no last time. Mohuela. The scorpion started crying. It did not know what to say because the elephant was telling the truth. No, scorpion! Raunzo sinaka your crocodile tears. Haki siki bonimo to your sinandi tongue jack away na. Motomo waiti hene weeds hole and capehuli bitir. Then maybe, just maybe, nenka naga wheats were ill. Last time, Scorpion. Wankuta, Kari last time. Thank you. Thank you, Elephant. I promise, I cross my heart and hope to die. Let's go. The Scorpion ran up a tree and jumped onto the Elephant's back. The elephant slowly walked into the roaring waters of the river. Stones hit its legs, knees and feet. It just kept on walking. The sun was going down and they had to get home before it was dark. The elephant saw a huge tree coming down the river in their direction. Stones hit its legs. Oh, I'm so sorry. The elephant saw a huge tree coming down the river in their direction. It lifted its front legs and the tree went swoosh past them. Ish. That was very scary. The elephant sighed. And it put its feet back into the water. The scorpion got so excited that it forgot its promise. It started singing and dancing on the elephant's back. Oh, Dala, 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 elephant! <laughs> then the tail went and bit the elephant. Scorpion ran all the way back near the small tail of the elephant. Wabona Scorpion. Wabona Scorpion. Waipona huru umutu yojang. Fuluha. Kari fuluha man. Askisi. Askisi tle abuti wame. I'm so sorry. It's true as God. Kaitola. It's not me. The elephant ignored the scorpion and kept on going into the deep waters. The scorpion ran to the head, then to the horns, then to the end of the, tr of the trunk. It was scared, shivering all over. Then slowly the elephant came out of the water. The horns, the head, the back, the tail. The scorpion got so relieved that it started. It started singing and dancing on the wet back of the elephant. Unfortunately, the, the tail went. <laughs> Again. <laughs> By this time, the elephant had given up completely given up. It decided it would deal with the scorpion when they got to the other side. So to cut the long story short, by the time the elephant got to the other side, 
its back looked like it was carrying strawberries on its back from the many little bites of the scorpion. Hey, never ever trust a scorpion. What do you think the scorpion said to the elephant when they got to the other side? <laughs> yeah. Scorpions like saying, no, I'm not like any other scorpions. They all say that. My name is Tato Kral, and thank you so much for listening. I've, I've, I wrote this thing, I've heard it so many times, but there are new lessons every time. Tell me what you learned. One word, one sentence, one image, one... We're creatures of habit. <laughs> Ma. Defense mechanism. Defense mechanism. Yeah. Ha. Huh. I thought you were here. <laughs> yeah. Abuse. Yeah. Self centeredness. Use an opportunity when you are given. You're given a ride, take a ride. Yeah, there are people you promote and they bite. They bite. I didn't want to apply these things. There are so many things. They had their differences, but they were working together. The elephant gave up on the scorpion and said, okay, we'll deal with you when we get to the other side. Let's finish our report. Let's finish our assignment. We'll deal with each other the other side. But by that time, the back is red. Yeah? It also talks about being the enabler. How, how, you see, what is the solution for this tail that keeps biting and it's out of control? Cut it. Who must cut it? Who must cut the tail? The scorpion. Because if you need some management cuts your tail, you'll find a prosthetic tail. Because you don't own it. Yeah. Bra, bra. I was, I was, I was with, a, with a psychiatrist uh, two weeks ago. We were in a panel together. She was explaining the issue of being an alcoholic. Alcoholic. A and she says, one of the tests is simple, simple. Go for three, four weeks without. See if you care. See if you care. Now, now, don't argue with everybody. Uh, no. Is this woman saying I'm an alcoholic? No, 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 she's not saying that. She's not saying that. But what are you saying? What are you saying? How come you always, like I said earlier, how come you always scorpion? How come you always struggle every Monday or a day after the holidays or... How come? How come? Scorpion, talk to us. Do you need help? This, this university has a wellness program. Go. You'd rather embarrass yourself by going there than ending up an absolutely helpless alcoholic. You, you're on drugs. Drugs have guaranteed destinations. Guaranteed. You either go to the grave or prison or hospital or, 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 or rehab. 
guaranteed destinations, no other, unless you stop now. Gambling, it's your tail gambling, whatever tail it is, you cut it. Nobody else. And, and, and my understanding is that the university is willing to assist you without embarrassing you. The, the POPIA Act protects you further that what you confide with them on, they dare not tell anybody. Ladies and gentlemen, don't suffer in silence. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dames and yere manene na manene kasi, bumele buntati. You know, I think the conclusion is, is so deep and it needs a moment of reflection other than a moment of questions. I'm asking myself, if we say questions, what questions are we going to ask? What, what questions am I going to ask? Because I personally have had it all. And uh, I'm asking myself, in this context, who am I? Because that's where the whole story began. In the slides that I projected when I opened, there was a dam, a stone being thrown onto the dam, and there were ripples. All of us, we are reflecting that image, Bronfenbrenner's model, that from the microsystem, there are epistemic factors which creates ripples across all of us. And I'm trying to find myself and say, what factors have I brought into my work environment? What I need to undo, what I need to do so that I become an enabler and a contributor of good things. Am I a person who is contributing, going forward, building and not destroying? Am I peaceful with me? Because if I'm not peaceful with me, I become a fighter. Anything can trigger war. And then I'll be saying, well, I'm from Attridgeville. Né? Those who don't know Attridgeville. I'll be saying, hey, I come from Pele off. <laughs> and then is this thing really warranting us to know that you are from Pelendaba? What has Pelendaba to do with this? This is work. Because most of us are like in the fight or flee more flight. You, you fight or you run away. We, we don't need that. And I got this sense when I, I joined this unit in the second week to say, you, such emails, you, ah, you. <laughs> and I said, I need to confront this. And confronting this war zone, it's, it's, a, it's a way of saying, Prof Mutsa, what are you experiencing? You came in May. She said, I'm feeling the same thing. We need to deal with this thing. And then that's where we are. That was the purpose of the workshop. Colleagues, peace help me. I don't need to wait for an apology. But I need to, apolo to forgive before somebody apologizes. That's the remedy of life, whether at home, work environment, community, 
peace and my thoughts control and my heart controls my mouth. I'll flee to the Bible again. I don't say that is the ultimate truth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What are you full of? When you write that email, I ask myself, what is this person full of? Sometimes you feel like seeing the person and saying, hmm, what's happening with you? What's wrong with you? Because you have the energy, negative energy of writing, you know. Bam, 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 capital letter. You know, and I ask myself, yo, war zone, Afghanistan, yo. <laughs> and, and I'm from a, a college that was peaceful. The satisfaction survey of this university, it depicts the College of Education as being green. I'm from that context. I don't know a war zone. I led a college in teaching and learning which had 102,000 students. I'm receiving all the queries from 102,000. We had a staff component, although not so large, but the, the academic was 286. The admin, I think, were more than that. And uh, it was joy on earth. Now I come to this war zone. And I said, I can't operate, I can't function. My mind is full of peace. And for me to lead peacefully, I need to take a scrubbing brush. Prof. Moza, she said, I have a, a scawara, pot scawara. Then we said, Vim, or Hendi Endi, Pangel. I'm trying to dramatize this, colleagues. This is the biggest unit, but the war zones in the emails. Yo, yo, colleagues, let's work on this. Let's work on this. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What is your heart full of? Next time when you start to write, ask yourself, out of the abundance of the heart. What am I telling uh, uh, the other colleague? And then they will always CC you. I say, yo, Uncle Siam, I'm taking data. I'm a researcher. I can write about all those emails. I'm a researcher, and I'm a researcher of wellness. But I said, yo, Poppy Act, let me not. Maybe after this session, we will be able to think peacefully to relax and to forgive and to say I'm here as an elephant, but I need to make my story right. Scorpion, as we cross the river, cut your tail. Cut your tail. So colleagues, this is where we are. This is, this is who I am as the acting. I'm still on Hollywood acting, whether they renew it or not, I don't care. But I have taken my scawara, pot scawara, scrubbing brush, vim, handy andy, pine gel, and then I try to clean the floor. Amen. Colleagues, we cannot live in a toxic environment and be the contributor of poison. No. We are going to die early. I want to live up to age 90 something and 100. And I'm not going to allow a situation that will terminate my life early. There's a book which is saying happiness is a choice. Start to read literature that will feed you with joy, with peace. Happiness is a choice. Is a choice. And whatever that I have, our mentor, our mentor has outlined that deal with the mental model and work on it. 
Fortunately, I don't know you. And I said, before I know them, let me clean first. Even if they can chase me away, no problem. But Handy Andy will be smelling. <laughs> Handy Andy will be smelling that no, she passed here. Who? Mama Khanu. Not even Prof Mahano. Mama Khanu. Yes. We cannot. We cannot live in a toxic world. And I'm the contributor of toxicity if I'm allowing it. Am I in a clique? Get out of the clique. You are an individual. If you are still studying, get that PhD, get that professorship. If you are not writing, you are a doctor, start to write papers. Pour out your anger onto the paper and say, according to so-and-so, emotional intelligence is and publish. Be known with positive things. When we Google your name, let us see positive things. Let us not see bad things. No, no. I love UNISA. I, I grew up at UNISA. I studied here from 1981 when I started my BA. UNISA made me who I am. I did my honors here. Masters, I went to UP. I didn't like their model because their model was saying I must come to class. No, I'm a UNISA material. I study on my own. I have my own way of studying. I came back here for my PhD. So, colleagues, Question time to Ndate. This time we are not writing, we are asking. Dr. Jerimu Fuke, just come up front and help us to remove the tail of the Scorpio. The time is gone. The time is gone. But they have questions. Anyone with a question, just do this. There is a question there. Ndate Tebohonguban. I wanted to ask her, but I think it's also in your zone. Uh, during my, my school career, I was told to, to think by one teacher. Please think, think, think. And I had it coming out here again. Uh, please manage, please regulate, please do so and so. Reflect. Or reflect. Yeah. But I miss the, the techniques. How do I do that? How do I think? How do I manage? How do I regulate? How do I adapt my mental model? So I'm just saying that would have been useful if, if you, I saw uh, some clips of it, but I, I would have done it more. Yeah, you can't microwave it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if necessary, get a coach, uh, coach, mentor, whatever. That will help you to actually say, Go about it this way. Go and exercise this first. For starters, I'm saying to you, take what uh, the psychologist was saying, use, put it in front of you, and I challenge you to reflect. What is it that makes you to feel and to think this way? What is it about me? Before a psychologist or anybody comes, what is it that makes me to feel feel this way. That is that. Uh -huh. um, uh, 
another thing which makes one to reflect. <clears throat> do unto others as you would like them do unto you. If I reverse this thing and it comes to me, will I be happy? That's it. That's it. And, and that is the basic fundamental golden rule in life. If at all I'm going to be angry and I take this cup, I throw you because I'm angry. How is the anger? If this cup is thrown back at me, will I be happy? Just simple, simple logical thing. Do unto us as you love them do unto you. And respect. I'm the chairperson of UNISA Women's Forum. As I started in the office last year, I said, we are going to have cleaners on board. They are women just like us. Why I respect them? For this woman to be clean is an ordinary woman without metric. And why am I excluding her in UNISA Women's Forum? And when those cleaners, we are going far. They are recruiting. They are bringing ideas. They don't have metrics, some of them. Their basic skill is to clean, to sweep. But their brain is functioning so well. Respect people. If you can respect anyone, whether it's an admin, is a professor, is an ordinary person, then you are going to win in life. That's a reflection. Simple as all day. Simple as all day. When I entered here, I did not know Tato. That Tato is with the Dr. Jane Mumuge. I greeted him. Mm. And I didn't know you. I greeted him. How are you? Fine. And then I got in. Most of you I greeted. I greeted. I was just saying, how are you? Hi. I don't know whether you are a professor or you are miss or missus or what, but you are a person created in the image of the Almighty. Respect people, that's the basic problem. But the minute you disrespect people, you are creating a problem for yourself. Don't think you are hurting the other person, but you are hurting yourself. And you don't sleep at night. Can I, can I, can I challenge a few people to use this as their screensaver? or put it next to, on a wall somewhere, it's, it's again, even if you don't write the verse, Luke 6, 43 to 45, and I want to change, to take the liberty. It says trees. I'm going to write colleague. No good colleague bears bad fruit, nor does a bad colleague bear good fruit. Each colleague is recognized by their own fruit. People do not pick managers from gossips. A good colleague brings good things out of the good, stores up in their heart. And an evil colleague brings evil things out of their evil stored in their heart. Why? The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Even if you write only that, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Let me try this. I say to my kids, come, somebody comes to you and say, you're a man, brah, just little man. Yo. No, no, Lelek is not bad enough. You look like a gorilla from the Congo. Yer, man. Corey, I get sour in my mouth just looking at you. I say, don't fight. Don't fight. Just say, oh, Daddy Jerry, thank you. You know, I've worked 32 years in UNISA. Nobody has told me that. Thank you very much. Go and drink water. Come back and say, Daddy Jerry, just in case I'm not a gorilla, can you go and get your head and your eyes examined? Because you see gorillas where there are no gorillas. 
I hope I'm making sense. This is not just pure motivational talk. Listen to me. If I insult you, it's my problem, not yours. I know it hurts, but the problem is with me. If I've got the courage to insult you, I'm sick and I need help. Thank you very much for still being here with us. Normally, this is a graveyard a shift, more or less. But it just goes to show how important, how significant. Sorry about that. But it just goes to show how undervalued some of us ascribe to wellness. And your presence here this afternoon, at this particular moment in time, I counted, it seems there's five extra profs that joined us in the last hour. It just goes to show what premium you pay for these two presentations that we had here today. And for that, colleagues, all I want to say before I extend our thanks to each and every one of you is to leave you the message. There's not even 25% from the department present here today. And we are simply saying, please assist as agents of change. After listening to these two informative presentations, speaking from experience, speaking from the heart, sharing with us moments, sharing with us various anecdotes, I think it is only proper for us who are present here to go back to our directors, to our units, and to share all this wealth of knowledge and experience that was shared with us today. Uh, don't get frustrated. We heard about anger management. Don't simply say, go and listen to the recording. I see it's being recorded. But show your empathy. Show your humaneness, as Prof. Mahano started off when she set the tone and the background. And I think, colleagues, sorry to be pedantic, uh, in your IPMS, UNISA pays premium to the six values and the 11 Cs plus one. It's not something like, you know, a checkbox exercise. You need to live the UNISA values. You need to live the principles of Ubuntu. As Prof. Mahano started off. Uh, so, colleagues, that's briefly what I wanted to say, but let me do the vote of thanks in a very short uh, uh, while. Uh, firstly, Nkate uh, Mahoro, our very, very sincere thanks, having taken the time off selflessly to spend the day with us. Uh, it really shows your Bartopili principles, your 
sense of Ubuntu to share this wealth of knowledge and experience. Your model of emotional intelligence with those four quadrants in each of those, I think, was indeed very refreshing. And it gave us an added perspective and dimension to our being, to our humaneness. You also spoke about mental modeling. And I always equate mental modeling to our teaching and learning philosophy. And how often do we reflect on this teaching and learning philosophy uh, within the lens of mental modeling? And I think you spelt it out very, very clearly. The need to constantly be circumspect and to reflect. The world is changing. Technology is changing and so forth. How can we still be rooted in mental modeling for the last 50 years? Ma'am, you also spoke about the importance of managing self-regulation, which many of us, I think, take for granted. And for your time, for your presence, for sharing your wealth of knowledge, experience, we can't thank you enough. And I sincerely hope this will be a constant engagement, even if you want uh, you know, to set up a community of practice, uh, we'll be more than willing to partner with you in any way. Then, colleagues, let me thank Dr. Jerry Mufukeng. I really enjoyed Wamacheta. Wama right. Prof, I hope you don't do me down with my IPMS. <laughs> the full day. But sir, your practical experience, sharing with us your personal journey, we really feel the painful part of your journey. But you ended off having reflected, having accepted, and now you're moving forward. And I think that's what we want to appreciate and request all of us who are in this room today to learn from your experience. You have forgiven, you have accepted, and you are now looking to the future and looking forward. I really enjoyed some of the aspects that you touched on in terms of reflection. And I think for us, anger management uh, is key. And you pointed out how much of energy it takes to get angry. And I think we learned a lot, you know, from the moments, from your anecdotes that you shared. You also reminded us about bullies in the workplace. Uh, sometimes they are, you know, wolves in sheep's clothes. You can't see it clearly. And I think. Uh, Prof. Motsa also highlighted the fact that, you know, at face value, we are happy when someone gets promoted, but we have these knives all around waiting. And I think, Doctor, we really enjoyed uh, all your examples that you used to share with us on how to reflect, what strategies we need. And in your last response, you also mentioned it's nothing untoward, you know, to engage the services of a coach, of a mentor. And I must indicate at UNISA, we pay high premium towards mentorship. If you are about 60, as part of your IPMS, you have to mentor somebody. So, you know, we, we are there. Uh, for example, in my directorate, we have about 28 on our database who are either being mentored, coached, and so forth. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm hoping by next year you'll have one episode on UNISA in one of your series. <laughs> uh, I think you can have it on Netflix where it's free. Uh, <laughs> so 
Colleagues are not forgetting Katlego. Oh, ka sorry, Kato. You know, I haven't seen anyone in a while that was able to use that emotion, passion, and the story you told will be forever etched in many of our minds for years to come. The elephant and the scorpion. Remember, she didn't talk about the ox. She spoke <laughs> about the scorpion. Then, colleagues, let me go to Prof. Mahano. Prof, this day would have not been possible without your foresight, without your leadership, without receiving emails with capital letters. <laughs> uh, Prof, I think the entire DTSFL wishes to place on record its very, very sincere thanks to your foresight, to that innovative thought leadership in putting together this program. We are really, really proud of you. And we can see, uh, without blinking an eyelid, your passion towards wellness, the psychology of pedagogy, if ever there is such a thing, uh, the importance you pay towards uh, human relations, the importance to work in a team, the importance to work without conflict, but as you mentioned, on life's journey you will always find cats, dogs, lions, and various other impediments and enablers. But how we circumvent those obstacles and use those enablers are key. And finally, colleagues, let me pay homage and our sincere thanks to Professor Motsa Madikane, the Vice Principal Teaching, Learning, Community Engagement, and student support, even though she was busy, couldn't make the original time slot, but she still showed us support yes. for joining us, even if it was a bit late. <laughs> and I think she highlighted the importance of our contributions to the academic project. She spoke about how to manage culture change how to respond to it. And she also spoke about one's effort to deal with anger. And I think colleagues, from all the talks, we you know, came to understand the importance of anger management. And as someone said, you know, getting angry for what? And I think that is what we need to reflect on. And colleagues, finally, to each and every one of you for being with us, not forgetting the administrators for the logistics, the cameraman, I think he's a bit tired now, he's having a seat. But thank you very much, sir. We really appreciate each and every one of your contribution and your presence. Thank you very much. Sir.